Okay, now that we are live to going live to our friends on YouTube, uh, we'd love to have you keep introducing yourselves um, as you continue to send your name and where you're calling in from in the chat. I have just a couple more housekeeping notes to share. Um, when we get started, please be sure to share any questions you have for presenters in the Q&A panel. Um, that is accessible in your Zoom toolbar. Once you open the Q&A panel, you can click to type your question in the window that pops up. Please begin your question with the speaker's name so we know to whom it's directed. And be sure to hit send. We will be doing live Q&A for most of our speakers after their presentations. If you are having any connectivity issues, we do have two options for you. The first is you can view this event on our live stream on YouTube by clicking the link that we are adding to the chat now. You are also welcome to call in from your phone for better audio by clicking the switch to phone audio and following the prompts to dial. That's available in the audio <laughs> settings panel. Okay, and here is a brief overview of today's agenda. We will have some introductory remarks, followed by <clears throat> presentations, and concluding with a panel discussion with all presenters. We hope you can stay for the entire program, but if you do have to step away, we will be posting a full recording of the event on the event website, as well as our YouTube channel. As a reminder, today is day one of the Seattle Cell Science Symposium, and we will be focused on cell nucleus research today. We will be hosting a second half day of presentations tomorrow from 8.30 a.m. to noon Pacific time. We will also be hosting a question and answer session for four featured tools available on allencell.org. Tomorrow, a few Allen Institute for Cell Science um, researchers will be um, spotlighting these four tools and giving you a little introduction. So if you do have more questions, if you're a current user or a hopeful user, we highly encourage you to register for this separate Zoom meeting. You can visit alleninstitute.org slash tools Q&A to register. That will be taking place from 12.15 to 1.15 tomorrow, Friday, December 18th directly after day two of the symposium. And we will be sending the link to that periodically in the chat today. Great, and as we let more people in, um, again, that link to the live stream uh, to YouTube is in the chat panel now. And here's just a recap of our day one agenda today for those of you just joining us. Excellent. We have Rodrigo from Brazil. Excellent, welcome. Jason from New Jersey, good morning. Jim from UPenn, great. Well, now we've hit 8.30 a.m. Pacific time. I am going to introduce Deputy Director of the Allen Institute for Cell Science, Susan Rafalski. She'll be giving some opening remarks this morning to kick off the symposium. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Megan. Um, and welcome to everyone um, to our now virtual Seattle Cell Science Symposium. I'm Susan Lorfalski and I'm Deputy Director of the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And I am really happy to see all of you guys in the chat window. I can see so many familiar names, even people from all the way back from my undergraduate days. So this is really awesome and from all over the world. So welcome. It's been a particularly challenging year, of course. Um, and we are really thankful to be hosting our fifth annual Seattle Cell Science Symposium virtually to highlight the exciting research throughout the cell biology community and to give you guys an update on um, what we've been doing at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. So I wanna take a really quick moment and thank our symposium committee, um, our group of internal volunteers who spend countless hours organizing this program. So I'm gonna give a shout out to a couple of those, um, our co-chairs, Melissa Hendershot and Julie Cass, and our committee members, 
Irina Muller, Jamie Sherman, Megan Whiting, and Kilista Yan. We can all give them a round of applause, even though we can't all hear you. <laughs> you can't all hear us. So, um, I also really want to thank um, the teams across the Institute, both scientific and administrative, who've been incredibly flexible in working from home or have kept all of our things moving at the Institute as phase one and two employees during these ongoing modified and very strange work lives due to COVID-19. Team science has really been tested this year and we're very grateful for everyone's contributions and keeping us moving and working towards our mission. So thank you to everyone. So um, as mentioned in a press release uh, last Friday, we've announced some leadership changes within the Allen Institute for Cell Science. Luke Nawardene will lead the Institute as our new executive director as we prepare to embark on a new focus on programmatic science while still generating our foundational resources for all of you in the field. Rick Horowitz is not leaving. <laughs> he will assume the role of the Institute's senior advisor. We are extraordinarily grateful for everything that Rick has done, his vision, his leadership in establishing and growing the Institute, and he will continue to be active as our advisor and in the Institute's dissemination and alliance efforts. Our Symposium program this year looks a little bit different. We won't get to see each other in person or have our usual poster session. And I'm incredibly disappointed by that. But uh, we have presentations from labs across the country and we've asked teams at the Allen Institute for Cell Science to also share research updates and highlight our tools and resources over the next two days. So today I'm especially excited. We will be featuring presenters focused on research on the nucleus. And that will also include at the very end of the day, um, the nucleus work being done within our institute. So um, now I have to actually make sure I move my slides here. <laughs> Before we uh, get started with the full agenda, I just wanted to tell you a little bit more once I can get control over the slides. There we go. Oops, too far. A little bit more about what we do at the institute and how we do it. So we are a group of about 70 people all working together. Um, it used to be under one roof, now it's under many, many roofs, um, but we are all working together in one, uh, one institute on institute-wide big projects as a team. Our values and approach are all about team science. Um, we really work together from the ground up and do everything together in a way that we hope will empower our community of scientists and beyond. And we want everything that we do to be open and accessible and impactful and we want to contribute to understanding the cell in ways that individual labs cannot, so we can all come together to solve the hard questions in cell biology. Let's see if everything's working now. Oops. So at the Allen Institute for Cell Science, this is one of my favorite slides, we want to understand the cell, all of you guys do too. We want to work towards being able to just look at a cell and know what it is doing, what it did, and what it will do. We believe that this should be possible because of the such tight interplay between cell organization and function. If we could see all of the main parts of a cell in time, understand the morphologies, positions, and dynamics of all of the key structures, we think that those all together would define the state of a cell and how it is behaving through time. So um, we're really interested in some very basic science questions. Um, they are written here, including how to define and categorize cells, create a meaningful and useful cell atlas. My personal favorite, which is what are the principles of cell organization? And then of course, how does change at the cells transition between states? And our model system permits us to ask those questions of state change very naturally in the stem cell as it differentiates or with regard to regeneration, which of course also ties things back to understanding what happens in disease. Our approach is a holistic one, focused very much on this intermediate uh, scale of cellular structures um, and wanting to watch them uh, in live cells in 3D. So we try to take that holistic approach and we do a lot of imaging, which is really our bread and butter, but we combine that with many other things. Our model system is the human-induced pluripotent stem cell in its undifferentiated state and uh, currently during its uh, differentiation process to the cardiomyocyte and all the lovely states in between. We want to take the approach of visualizing the morphologies, positions, dynamics of all those structures, as I've been saying, and to do that in an un as unperturbed a cell as possible. So we've used endogenous GFP tagging to create very carefully QC'd lines that we can image. And we also create very robust and usable methods for differentiation. 
Our workhorse is the microscope. Uh, we build microscope pipelines for reproducibility and assays to help us reference where our structures are within cells. And we care deeply about that holistic approach and in integrating all parts of the cell to give this a sort of bigger picture um, understanding. And so of course we want to integrate at the level of structural organization and we have methods to do that. Um, but we are also now going to be and have been conjoining this with information on gene expression, including spatial gene expression, to really bring together that additional dimension um, to build our state space. All that we do is quantitative, and we want to head everything towards analysis and modeling for new insights, including necessary tools, technical breakthroughs, and our modeling can span from biophysical modeling of cell morphogenesis, to wonderful advantages in the world of machine learning to incorporate modern statistical approaches. And everything that we do, we want to present in a platform that is accessible and permits us to interact with all of you. So we have a lot of work. We've started on the undifferentiated cell and the cardiomyocyte, and we are now taking full advantage of the fact that we have this beautiful differentiation system to look for a state change. So stay tuned on more in that. As you guys can imagine, as we all do this, we face many challenges. And so as we were solving our own problems to move our science forward, we developed application specific tools that turns out that generalize very well for many of you. So we are working on assembling these tools into the Allen Cell Explorer Toolkit, which includes everything from our stem cell lines um, and methods all the way to new simulation platforms. We want to pave an accessible and robust road uh, from image to information in a quantitative and human interpretable manner. I'm gonna really emphasize that one. Um, and so tomorrow you will hear more about four components of this toolkit and hopefully find ways that that can work for you. Everything we do, you can find on our website, our portal, the Allen Cell Explorer. So if I've done one thing today um, successfully, it will be to have sent you to that website. And if so, then I have succeeded. So please take a look, everything is there. I wanna take a moment um, and thank our founder, Paul Allen, for everything he's done, his vision, encouragement, and support. Um, so thank you, Paul. And I wanna turn this back over, I think to Melissa now, but leave this agenda on. Thank you all for your attention and pass it on to Melissa and we can begin the show. Great. Uh, thank you, Susan, for introducing the Institute for Cell Science. Um, my name is Melissa Hendershot, and I'm a scientist on the assay development team, and I'm also one of the co-chairs this year of the Cell Science Symposium Planning Committee. So before we get started with our first talk, I just want to remind everybody that we'll take questions today via the Q&A panel, um, and so we'll be choosing questions um, for our speakers to answer. And so we ask uh, that you please submit any questions uh, through that panel rather than in the chat. And now, without any further ado, um, I'm really excited to introduce our first speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Gita Narlikar. So Dr. Narlikar is a professor of biochemistry and biophysics and the Lewis and Ruth Cousin Chair at the University of California, San Francisco, where she studies how the folding and compartmentalization of our genome is regulated to generate the many cell types that make up our body. Her laboratory has pioneered the application of sophisticated biophysical approaches to study the mechanism of macromolecules that regulate genome organization. And today she'll be giving a talk about whether phase separation can explain heterochromatin functions. Gita, please take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, and I have remote, it looks like I have remote control of the screen. This is great. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real pleasure uh, to be part of the symposium and share some of our uh, recent collaborative work. Um, so, as uh, all of you know, uh, most eukaryotic genomes are packaged in the form of chromatin. And uh, this type of packaging occurs at many levels, at the level of uh, nucleosomes and at higher levels when nucleosomes come together to form uh, higher, higher level uh, compacted structures. So this, this type of packaging into chromatin allows a compartmentalization, compartmentalization of the genome um, differently in different cell types. Okay? And so um, this compartmentalization, uh, because it's different in a heart cell versus a lung cell, allows a heart cell to be a heart cell and a lung cell to be a lung cell. And so uh, it allows uh, different cell identities. Now, misfolding of the genome can conversely cause a cell to have an identity crisis, 
make a heart cell realize perhaps I'm not a heart cell and lead to diseases such as, um, such as cancer. And so we are interested in understanding the biophysical mechanisms that um, allow chromatin to be regulated in cells. And uh, we, we study chromatin at two different levels, uh, mechanisms that keep chromatin open. And open regions of chromatin are often called euchromatin. And these regions, um, genes are more often on. And mechanisms that keep chromatin closed, and these regions are often called heterochromatin, where the genome is inaccessible and genes in these regions are off. So this is a somewhat simplistic description of how chromatin compartmentalizes the genome, but it provides a context to ask uh, questions from a very fundamental and biophysical level. And so what my lab is interested in is understanding the chromatin regulators that allow the genome to be packaged into on and off states. And today I'm going to share with you some of our recent work on understanding the biophysical mechanisms of heterochromatin, which is this, the this compacted state of the genome that is less accessible. And I'll, I'll switch to a very classic description of heterochromatin. Um, here, show, shown here is a EM uh, staining picture of a mammalian cell. And you can see that in the nucleus, the genome is organized into dark patches, which represent more compacted chromatin, and light patches, which represent more open chromatin. And again, the open chromatin is called euchromatin, and the compacted uh, chromatin, or the dark patches, are called heterochromatin. Now, um, a, a very common type of heterochromatin is mediated by a protein called HP1, and that's the type of heterochromatin that my lab studies. This type of heterochromatin serves many different functions. And it, uh, it is mediated at its heart by an interaction between the protein HP1 and chromatin that's methylated on histone H3 lysine 9 um, in, in a very, in a very, very specific position. So this complex between the HP1 protein shown in blue and chromatin that's methylated is thought to serve all of these different functions in a cell. Um, so heterochromatin mediated by HP1 can repress transcription. It can repress recombination it can enable proper chromosome segregation, and it can confer rigidity to the whole nucleus. And so it is um, kind of cool to imagine how this seemingly simple platform can enable such diverse functions in, in a cell that span across multiple scales, from the scale of repressing a single gene to the scale of conferring rigidity to the whole nucleus. And again, I want to emphasize that this work is based on the work of many folks in the field um, who have come before us. So an overarching question that my lab is interested in asking is, how does HP1 media heterochromatin serve so many di uh, different roles? And as we uh, address this question, we also keep in mind some of the paradoxical uh, biophysical behaviors that HP1 media heterochromatin shows in cells. And we believe that understanding these kinds of seemingly paradoxical behaviors might give us insight into um, how this type of heterochromatin actually functions and what are the underlying biophysical mechanisms. So here is one example of a seemingly paradoxical um, behavior of HP1 heterochromatin. So on the one hand, heterochromatin mediated by HP1 and, and its friends can form stable territories, territories that are stable over hours and sometimes days in terms of nuclear position. Okay, so this territory will remain in its place for several hours, if not days. Okay. Um, but on the other hand, if you do FRAP experiments with labeled HP1 proteins, as shown by these uh, experiments done a while ago by the Mistelli and Kiosis labs, if you FRAP fluorescently labeled HP1, it recovers within seconds. Okay. So HP1 proteins that are maintaining these stable structures come on and off on the order of seconds. And so, one of the fundamental questions that we are interested in understanding is how do molecules that come on and off on the order of seconds maintain structures that are stable on the order of hours, if not days? Okay. And to get at these kinds of questions, again, we try to understand what are the biophysical mechanisms underlying these properties of heterochromatin. Now, before I describe uh, what we've learned most recently in our prior work, uh, let me give you a proper introduction to the HP1 protein. Okay. So HP1 proteins are typically dimers, and they have a domain architecture that is conserved all the way from uh, yeast to humans. So on, you have two folded domains, a chroma domain shown here that binds the methylated tail of histones, a chroma shadow domain shown here that forms a dimerization interface and allows the protein to be a dimer, and three unstructured regions, a hinge that is positively charged and binds both DNA and RNA, 
and an N-terminal extension and a C-terminal extension. Now, um, we've been studying this protein for a while and we've learned a few things. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize a lot of what we have learned in, in the next slide. What we've learned over uh, uh, the, the last several years is that HP1 proteins can oligomerize. They can oligomerize across chromatin. And this oligomerization allows these proteins to do two things simultaneously, to compact the chromatin and to form phase separated droplets within which this compacted chromatin is organized. Okay. And, um, and so this, this kind of behavior of HP1 proteins has given us a new perspective to uh, ask old questions. So our old questions remain, how does heterochromatin serve so many, uh, so many uh, functions? But we can now ask those same questions from the perspective of the phase separation behavior of HB1 proteins. And uh, seeing this kind of behavior of HB1 proteins in the context of chromatin and in the context of DNA um, has allowed us to dig more deep biophysically to ask, what is it about the intrinsic properties of HB1 and DNA that allows heterochromatin in cells to uh, behave in, in so many different um, uh, roles? Okay. Um, and so today, what I'm going to share with you um, is work by uh, uh, an extremely talented graduate student, Madeline Keenan, who as of this month is graduating. Um, and this, this work is a close and complete collaboration with the work of my colleague, Cy Redding. So Madeline is a joint graduate student between my lab and Cy Redding's lab. So what Madeline wanted to ask was, um, can we understand the new mesoscale properties that are enabled by phase separation of HP1 in a test tube? And by understanding these new mesoscale properties, can we go back to the biology and begin to tease apart how HP1 proteins enable these diverse functions? And to do so, she did a bunch of experiments. I'm going to only share a subset of the experiments she did as part of her thesis today. So the subset of experiments I'm going to share with you um, have to do with her using HP1 proteins and uh, a defined piece of DNA as a model system for making HP1 DNA territories in a test tube. So again, a very simple system with the goal of uncovering the intrinsic biophysical properties of these molecules. Okay? So really go to the core of their, um, uh, of their biophysical behaviors. Okay, so here's what she asked. She said, if I take HP1 proteins and she's using a major HP1 protein in humans, HP1 alpha, mix it with DNA and form these droplets, can I treat these droplets as in vitro reconstituted genomic territories and study their properties and learn something about what happens in a cell? Okay? And again, an overarching question that she was asking is this one here, how does dynamic H1 binding result in stable and regulatable genome organization? Okay, so um, here's the first experiment she did that, I, that I'll share today. Uh, she said, if I make two types of genomic territories in a test tube, uh, which have differently labeled HP1 proteins. So one territory, one made from green droplets, which have green HP1, so you have green HP1, unlabeled DNA, green droplets, red HP1, which is labeled with the red fluorescent dye, unlabeled DNA, and red droplets. Okay. So the droplets are identical except for the label on the HP1 protein. Okay. And she asked, what happens when I mix these two preformed droplets, which you can again think of as you know, uh, model ter genomic territories in a test tube, what happens to the HP1? Do the droplets fuse? And does the HP1 mix between the two droplets? Okay. And uh, she waited for one, one and a half hours, and you'll see in a minute why she waited for one and a half hours. But when the droplets fuse, they round up. So, and when she looks at them under a microscope, all the droplets have red, all the droplets have, have green, and if you overlay, they're all yellow, okay? So what this says is when the droplets fuse, the HP1 very rapidly exchanges between the fused droplets. And when she does a time course that I'm not showing you here, she found that mixing occurs on the order of seconds, okay? So not surprising, I've sh I told you that in, in cells, HP1 molecules exchange on the order of seconds. So she's basically now recapitulating what people saw in a cell with this very simple system, okay? A droplets fuse, HP1 molecules rapidly mix up, okay? And even in this drop, these two droplets that are in the act of fusing, it's already yellow, okay? So you can, you can, you can get a feel for how rapidly these things are mixing up. She then did the flip experiment. She said, what happens when I label the DNA? So now it's the same type of experiment. She's labeled uh, the DNA green here and the DNA red here. Okay. Again, you have green droplets and red droplets. And she asked, we know that the droplets fuse and they round up. 
but what happens to the DNA from the original droplets? And this is what she saw. So what she saw is when the droplets fuse, you get, you get very little yellow. Okay? And it's most, most, most readily seen in these droplets here. So you can see this droplet has a, a, occurred from fusing of a red droplet and a green droplet. Okay? It's rounded up, so the surface tension has been restored. Okay? But the red DNA has stayed in its territory, and the green DNA has stayed in its territory. Now, this is pretty remarkable. There is nothing else in the system other than HP1 and DNA. Okay? And it's a pretty small piece of DNA here, 3 kb. Yet, on the order of one and a half hours, the red DNA is staying in its red territory, and the green DNA is staying in its green territory. Okay? So we've been able to recapitulate kinetically stable genomic territories from two simple components. Okay? Uh, so what could be going on here? How can we explain this behavior knowing everything we know about the biophysical properties of HP1 molecules. And so if we step back and ask, okay, we know a lot about HP1 proteins, how, how do we explain it? It's not, it's not that surprising in retrospect. Okay? So here's, here's our current model for how this, these kinds of stable, kinetically stable genomic territories can be formed in a test tube. We know that HP1 molecules can oligomerize. We know that they can bridge and compact DNA across uh, different regions of the DNA. And so what we propose is that HP1 molecules are bridging different regions of DNA, keeping the DNA compacted, and increasing the effective viscosity of the DNA. And so we know from the work of uh, a polymer chemist that the longer a polymer, the more viscous it becomes, and the same for DNA. Okay? So the longer the DNA, the more viscous it is. And so DNA has an interesting viscosity that scales with length. And so what we propose is that HP1 molecules are further increasing the viscosity of DNA by cross-bridging across different regions and keeping it kinetically trapped. Okay? So in this kind of a model, individual HP1 molecules can come on and off on the order of seconds and explore the nearby surroundings and, and can diffuse and mix up. But at any given point, a strand of DNA is going to be bound by multiple HP1 molecules that keep it kinetically trapped in its local uh, physical territory. Okay? And again, no, no magical interpretations here, all based on very simple biophysical principles. Okay? So this model makes sense based on everything we know about HP1 proteins, and, and led us to ask the next question, which is, okay, we can make kinetically stable genomic territories. We can explain how that happens. What about stability? Okay? What about mechanical stability of these territories? Okay? And to get at that question, uh, Madeline teamed up with a uh, former postdoc in the lab, uh, Lucy Brennan, and in, with help from uh, Roman Renger in Stefan Grill's lab, they carried out an optical trap experiment to ask how mechanically stable are these HP1 DNA phases. Okay? Uh, so the experiment, this premise is very simple. They took a long piece of DNA, in this case, a lam uh, from lambda DNA, uh, a long piece of lambda DNA, attached it on either end to a polystyrene bead, which was held, held in an optical trap. And the idea was that you could dip this long piece of DNA in a trough of HP1 that's fluorescently labeled, uh, shown here in purple. Uh, the HP1 would form, HP1 molecules would form a condensate in the middle of the DNA because the DNA has, um, has more slack in the middle and allows the DNA to fold up. So you can see this kind of a HP1 DNA uh, droplet or a condensate here in the middle. And then you could pull one end of the polystyrene uh, styrene bead and ask, when you exert force on this, what happens to the condensate? Okay, um, now these kinds of experiments have been done by many folks before us, where you can just take a plain piece of DNA and stretch it. So you can have force extension curves from DNA alone. And so we can compare what happens uh, to, these, uh, to, to these droplets uh, when you have HP1 versus when you don't have HP1, sorry, to these pieces of DNA, okay. So, so that's what Lucy and, and Madeline did. They took this long piece of DNA, they dipped it in a trough of uh, fluorescently labeled HP1, formed this droplet, and then pull the speed. Okay. Now, we know that HP1 behaves like a liquid in these droplets. So we expected that with a little bit of tugging, the droplets would fall apart. That was the simplest expectation. Instead, this is what they saw. Okay. You can pull. You can pull and the, and, and the droplets don't fall apart, okay? 
So, and, and uh, this goes for 10 successive pulls and the droplets don't fall apart, okay? So this was pretty surprising. And, and what is good about these kinds of experiments is that you can quantify them and you can get these force extension curves where you look at how much the DNA extends on, as you put more and more force on it. So here in black is the force extension curve for just DNA without any HP1. And, and as you can see, as you in the presence of HP1, the DNA can't be stretched all the way. Okay? There's a large amount of DNA that remains in, inside the droplet. Okay? And so uh, somehow the network of interactions that HP1 is making inside the droplets is conferring a large amount of mechanical stability to these droplets. And these droplets can withstand up to 40 piconewtons of force. So how do we how do we think of 40 piconewtons of force? Well, a good comparison is to compare it to the, the stall force for RNA polymerase. Uh, work from several folks has shown that RNA polymerases stall at forces 20 piconewtons or less. These structures can be stable up to 40 piconewtons. So structures generated by H1 proteins can, in principle, resist the mechanical brute force action of motors like RNA polymerase. Okay. That's, that's the level of mechanical stability you can get from these. Um, so th this was pretty cool to see that you can get high levels of mechanical stability. But that then raised another question, and this is the last, last uh, experimental result I'll share with you, which is if these phases are so stable, uh, how are these phases regulated? How are they uh, uh, regulated during, rep re during replication and differentiation okay? when heterochromatin has to come apart and become open? And so here's where Madeline asked, what about the other HP1 paralogs in humans? Okay. So everything I've shown you so far is with HP1 alpha, which is one of the main HP1 paralogs in, in humans that is part of heterochromatin uh, and that phase separates with DNA and chromatin. She asked, what happens when I use another HP1 paralog, HP1 beta, that is also known to regulate heterochromatin? Now, what's interesting about HP1 beta is that it does not form droplets with DNA, and it does not compact DNA. It does not um, uh, 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 compact DNA into phase-separated droplets. So she asked, what happens if I add an HP1 beta into droplets formed between HP1 alpha and DNA? Okay, so shown here are droplets with HP1 alpha and DNA and increasing concentrations of HP1 beta. So H1 beta dissolves the droplets formed by H3 and alpha. And what I'm not showing you are the time courses for these experiments. The dissolution happens on the order of seconds. Okay. And so even though these droplets or phases are very stable mechanically, kinetically, they can be dissolved very rapidly by competition. And our model is that H1 beta might act as a poison by heterodimerizing with H1 alpha. Okay. So to conclude, Coming back to the original questions, which is, which are, can the intrinsic biophysical properties of HP1 and its interaction with DNA explain its, 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 its uh, wide range of properties in a cell? We think we can. We think we are on a track to understanding at a very fundamental level how heterochromatin serves its diverse roles. And so we think this, at, at its heart, relies on oligomerization and rapid on-off dynamics of HP1 alpha and its ability to phase separate in the presence of DNA and chromatin. And so to conclude, we think that we can, we can explain how uh, HP1 molecules form DNA compartments that inhibit mixing of DNA, but allow mixing of HP1. And this kind of occlusion of DNA may enable repression of transcription and recombination, which, has been, which is one major property of heterochromatin. Um, I've shown you that compacted DNA formed by um, HP1 uh, interactions is highly resistant to biologically relevant forces. And so this may begin to explain how heterochromatin confers mechanical rigidity to the nuclear periphery and at the centromere. And um, at the same time, because HP1 molecules come on and off on the, on the order of seconds, it allows heterochromatin the ability to be rapidly dissolved by competition. Okay? And so uh, the combination of the biophysical properties of H1 molecules allow heterochromatin to have these un unusual and, and, and biologically meaningful properties. And I want to end by saying that what I've shown you is just one example of a genome organizing protein. But the properties of HP1 alpha DNA phases can help conceptualize mechanisms of genome compartmentalization by other genome packaging proteins. Okay, so this is just the beginning. I want to end by thanking, thanking all of you for coming to the symposium. Um, I want to give a big shout out to Madeline Keenan for really spearheading the experiments I described to you today. Uh, big shout out to my colleague and collaborator, Cy Redding. Um, 
Uh, shout out to Adam Larson, who got us into the phase separation field in the first place uh, by discovering uh, these properties for HP1 proteins. And to Serena Sanoli, uh, who uh, helped us understand how um, HP1 proteins could actually deform chromatin to allow it to form phases. And my funding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gita. That was an awesome. That was really fun. Um, we have a few questions that have come in um, in the Q&A. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll just start from the top. Um, one question that we had was, how do you predict the behavior of the droplets would change if chromatinized DNA was used instead of naked DNA? That's a great question. We are working on it. Um, so uh, I'll, try, I'll try to summarize. So uh, a lot has to do with how viscosity scales with length. So when you take the same piece of DNA and you chromatinize it, now the length gets shorter because you're wrapping up a large fraction of the DNA in chromatin. Uh, but if you make really long pieces of chromatin, we think we'll see the same behavior we're seeing with the 3KB or longer pieces of DNA. So we think chromatin um, with HP1 is going to give us very similar behaviors uh, because HP1 will have additional interactions with chromatin through the histone tails as well. So, cool. but those are ongoing, but it's a great question. Cool. Um, we had another question from Emily Hatch about whether the HP1 alpha binding strength changes under force. Ah, great question. So th <laughs> those are ongoing. What I did not point out because of time is um, some of you may have noticed that after every pull, the subsequent pull, it was hard, even harder to extend the DNA. And so what, um, Sire Redding fields and, uh, and, and Stefan Grill uh, uh, think are that when you pull it slightly, you're destabilizing HP1 DNA interactions and allowing them to resettle mm -hmm. and equilibrate to a more stable position. So we do think that tugging it and letting it go allows it to equilibrate to a more stable position and, 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 and increase the mechanical stability. So yes, we think it does affect um, affinity and, 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 and off rates. And then I think we'll do one more question. Um, we had a question wondering about what kinds of factors would regulate droplet size? Uh, that, that, that's a great question. A lot of different factors could regulate droplet size. Um, so let me add one more feature to that, droplet size and shape. So, um, so what I didn't show you is that if you take really long pieces of DNA, like the Lambda DNA, the droplets are no longer round. And that's because of the viscosity of the DNA. It takes a long time for the droplets to become round. So, um, so the, the longer the piece of DNA, the less round the droplets are, they're still liquid. But in terms of size, we think there's a variety of factors. We think it's um, uh, both the length of the DNA and the affinity of the HP1 with DNA and um, uh, uh, the ability of HP1 to oligomerize. So the oligomerization strength, the direct interaction with DNA, and the length of the DNA are all con contribute to the size. Cool, that's awesome. Um, there are a bunch more questions that have come in through the chat. And so if um, you're willing to type answers into people, um, that would be great. We can kind of continue the discussion. Sure. Um, and then I think we will introduce our next presenter who is Dr. Alexandra Zadowska. Uh, she's an assistant professor of physics at the Center for Soft Matter Research in the Physics Department at NYU. And her current research uses approaches from soft matter physics and polymer physics to study the cell nucleus and its constituents, such as the genome and subnuclear bodies, and in particular, their dynamics and spatial organization. So with that, I will hand it over to Dr. Zadowska. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to organizers for uh, the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Of course, I would prefer to be at Ellen Institute in person, but thank you so much for the opportunity to show you research uh, from my lab. Specifically, we are experimental cell biophysics lab and the main focus of our research is cell nucleus. We're very much interested in understanding the physical principle underlying uh, dynamic organization, active flows and emergent rheology uh, in the cell nucleus. So I will show you here 
uh, <laughs> I, I will show you in this talk today uh, kind of the two main trusts uh, of the research in my lab. The, um, the first uh, research direction that we're following uh, very diligently, we're focusing on the kind of the most prominent inhabitant of the cell nucleus and that's the genome and specifically on its dynamics and flows. And the second part, uh, the second trust that what we focus on is uh, we're looking also into dynamics and organization of other uh, nuclear constituents, specifically at their dynamics. As I will show you in this talk, uh, it's dynamics is enormously informative about the physics of the system so it can reveal you material properties of that specific constituent as well it's a local environment what in physics we refer to as a rheology so let me start uh briefly with the with the first part so with respect to genome so i think i hear i'm preaching to the choir so everyone knows uh, that the genome is enormously organized uh, inside of the cell nucleus right so past two decades have taught us thanks to uh flores and institute hybridization approaches as well as chromosome confirmation capture techniques uh, we have obtained this beautiful detailed uh, picture of how genome is folded inside of the nucleus, especially right high C techniques have provided us presently one kilobase pair resolution uh, picture of the folded genome in the nucleus from loops to topologically associated domains to A and B compartments to chromosome territories. So, although we have this enormous detail, one thing that we have to consider these pictures are static. So how does, do we reconcile this detailed static picture of the folding of the genome with this picture, what I'm showing you here, uh, what is a live cell nucleus uh, from a human cell with fluorescently labeled genome, you see clearly the genome is dynamic, there's a lot of motions, a lot of jiggles and wiggles, so how do we, how do we connect that? So this is something that we've been in my lab looking at the great detail in actually originally so 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 years ago when I entered the lab right the or, or the, this actual this field uh, the um, traditional approach to study uh, genome dynamics would be to to um, fluorescent label the protein of your interest and do single particle tracking so as a physicist I wanted to kind of you know to obtain a continuous picture of motion across the entire nucleus and um, um, as postdoc uh, with Tim Mitchison and Dave Waits, I have developed this metal displacement correlation uh, spectroscopy that uses fluorescently labeled histones across the entire nucleus at the same time and allows you to obtain actually maps across the entire nucleus, the maps of genomic motions. So we can do that in spectroscopy uh, like way, meaning we obtain actually maps of motions of displacements of genome at different time scales, as you can see here. Here in these two movies here on the left is a short time scale, 250 millisecond here at long time scales on the right over several seconds. So what you can see clearly in these uh, movies that the, the motion is different if you look at short times or long times. And the discovery that, um, that we made here uh, was uh, specifically this existence of the coherent motion at large length scale. So the arrows of this displacement that you are looking here at are colored by um, their direction. So you see at longer times there are regions of genome that actually move together, so large patches of genome move coherently uh, together. So we can, of course, so, so here, uh, when, when I draw outlines of these regions uh, at one snapshot at a time, you can see they're rather large. You can see the, the scale bar here. here. Oh, we can also extract using uh, spatial uh, autocorrelation functions. We can extract the, the size of these uh, coherent regions and see that genome indeed exhibits coherent motions on micrometer scale. So, of course, the first question that came to mind uh, with the picture that I showed you a couple of slides ago, are we looking actually at motion of chromosome territories? So here I go very quickly through one uh, beautiful experiment where we, in addition to our histones from which we obtain our maps, we stain also chromosome territories and obtain actually their outlines, their boundaries. So we analyze now the boundaries of our coherent regions with how do they how well do they overlap or do they overlap with the boundaries 
of chromosome territories. And what you see here from this uh, in this cartoon, uh, it's basically here you would have a purple and a green chromosome territories, and you see the red arrows would correspond to one coherent region. It clearly spans across beyond so be beyond chromosome territory so it spans across two or more neighboring territories such a region so we saw clearly that this is not a uh, functional unit of the motion so we have to look at the dynamics um at a more uh, mechanistic way so we first have uh, tested are these uh, motions active or passive right so we have uh, pro performed analysis of chromatin dynamics um upon atp depletion from our measurements we can look at average displacements as a function of time. And you see that the active uh, chromatin dynamics, it's much higher uh, than upon ATP depletion, so in its passive state. And it's act the active dynamics is subdiffusive at the uh, steady uh, time scales. Moreover, we have a spatial information where our displacements are. So we can actually compute also uh, the contributions um, of activities uh, from this uh, type of data at different uh, length scales. And we find that it's the large wavelengths that are actually dominated mostly by the activity. Specifically, together, together with uh, uh, our collaborators, uh, Shura Grosberg, Yitzhak Rabin, and Robin Brunsma, we have developed a continuum uh, theory based on hydrodynamic treatment, so on the presence of the nucleoplasm in uh, and, and the polymer solution in the nucleus, that predicted and that has shown us that a type of activity that can lead to such large-scale motions uh, must be or should be in a form of so-called force dipoles. What is a force dipole? So here you see my chromatin fiber. Those would be nuclear enzymes. And these green arrows correspond to the forces that they exhibit. And a force dipole is basically a pair of forces of uh, equally large magnitude, but opposite direction. So uh, we have further expanded beyond the continuum theory, building a numerical model together with Mike Shelley and uh, David Santian, um, where we have now got built computational simulation for the chromatin fiber with such activity in form of these dipoles uh, acting on it. And um, the result of our of our simulations here, uh, you can uh, see here right for yourself, is that you need a very specific type of this dipolar activity, and those are so-called extensile force dipoles, meaning outward pointing forces. So it's the nuclear enzymes that do have these outward pointing forces that actually can lead and are able to lead to these large-scale genomic motions. Uh, and that, however, in the presence of nucleoplasm, so they do have to interact hydrodynamically, or in other words, via fluid present, right? So this uh, arrangement would not exist if the hydrodynamics or if the interactions between these would not be present. So that was, uh, once we learned about these large-scale motions, we started to zoom in back um, into the detail of these uh, um, of these motions. So, so where does it come from? So this, the, what is a contribution of such activity on a single gene level? So to do so, so to kind of to zoom in and look at the, the function of these uh, force dipoles locally, we started to focus on uh, activity uh, of single genes, and specifically for this work, uh, former graduate student in my lab, Tang Yi Chu, who recently graduated, has implemented a CRISPR-Cas9 system to visualize um, genes such as IL-6 and MUC4 that we can follow in real time their motion. Now, in addition to following the motion of these genes, we actually are still simultaneously following the motion of the genome as such, so the chromatin, right? So with our DCS method, we measure the motion of the genome across the entire nucleus. Well, analyze um, uh, quantitatively the, the uh, extent of the coherent motions and so on. And at the same time, we perform here the single particle tracking of our gene um, within, within uh, the, the genome itself. So the data is co collected actually simultaneously. So we build a microscope where we use a simultaneous illumination with two wavelengths. And we're building basically two uh, spinning disconfocal images 
in parallel simultaneously. So we obtain this simultaneous dynamic data of motion of the gene that you see with this colorful trajectory here in the middle and the flows of the nearby genome next to it. So you can imagine this is enormously rich in uh, information. Moreover, we have chosen the genes in a way that we can actually toggle their activity. We can observe them in their inactive and active uh, state. So here, just an example, you see, so the, the fat arrow the, here would be the motion of the gene and the small arrows around it would be the uh, motions of the surrounding genome. And the pink correspond to the inactive, the green to active case. Now, when we look simply at the correlations of these two types of motions, what we find that it's the motion of the active gene. So here, the, the, the green curves, they, they show you the correlation as a function of distance away from the gene. So here at the zero, that would be the position of, the, of your gene center. And this is here with the increasing distance. So you see that the ac active genes clearly are co correlated with their neighboring uh, genomic flows, um, so which is consistent with our picture of activity and gene level driving the genome-wide motions. So this is a, a, a kind of a, a flavor of the dynamic studies that we uh, are performing in my lab on mechanistic level. And what I would like to show you now in the second part briefly is how rich this type of dynamic is in physical information about your system. So in addition to genome, we can use also other um, parts of nucleus, other nuclear constituents to teach us about the nuclear physics. Um, and specifically, we would be very interested about material properties of it. So, you know, as being physicists, what is the classical approach? So as a physicist, if you would study the classic nucleus in physics, which would be the atomic one, you take particles, bombard your nucleus with them, and that's how you learn about the, the atomic nucleus property. For the cell nucleus, you use a very similar approach. However, you take micro needle bombarded with particles again, and then you look at the interactions, right, of the particles with the nucleus. And that has been done before. So those are studies uh, that exist. But as you can see, so I drew in my cartoon here, the needle actually to its uh, real scale. So you see it, the needle is gigantic uh, when compared to the nucleus. So the method is rather invasive, right, uh, for the nucleus to deposit these type of particles. So what we were thinking about, well, could we use actually probes that are already present inside of the nucleus? And those here, in this case, for example, I show you a case study of the nucleolus. So you you see that nuclei are so so uh, conveniently already present. So could we could we actually use those? So the strategy that we have employed in my lab and have been used now using now for few years is to actually use the intrinsic, so spontaneous dynamics of uh, nuclear constituents or components to extract uh, material properties and physical properties uh, to understand their rheology. So let me show you what we have we learned using nucleolus. So for example, first, all right, when you look very closely um, with high spatial and temporal resolution at the surface of the nucleus, you can see this beautiful uh, well, surface fluctuations uh, on its surface. So there was a work done by a very talented undergrad, former undergrad in my lab who's presently a grad student at UC Berkeley, Shannon Haley, who has uh, collected this beautiful uh, data from uh, written this, this highly sensitive algorithm that allows us to extract these fluctuations. So you see here, those are now these fluctuations squared as a function of here of a polar angle. And why are we so excited about it? Because this is actually hugely uh, informative about the physical properties of the nuclear surface. So this directly allows you to measure and to basically estimate the surface then of the chromatin nucleus interface. And we obtain surface tension that is at the order of 10 to minus six newton per meter, which if uh, you're familiar with values uh, of, uh, for other materials, it's extremely low. This is consistent, such behavior is consistent with a liquid droplet. So another dynamic event in life of uh, nucleoli is fusion that we can observe. And now that we know that it's, it's a droplet, so we can uh, talk about coalescence. So this has been uh, a work by uh, another uh, great, great student in my lab who recently graduated, Christina Karajin, who has uh, developed this, this beautiful semi-automated algorithm, how to hunt for these events. As uh, probably many of you know, the nuclear events are extremely rare. 
So Christina has collected this data and why do we so much care about these uh, coalescences to know about them in that detail? It's because their shape uh, of uh, during the coalescent event, uh, specifically the neck connecting actually two coalescing nucleoli. So for example, here you see this experiment of uh, we hear fluorescently labeled genome, the two droplets coming together, and this is the growth of the neck as a function of time. Why do we care about it? It's because this is the information that carries the physics. It tells you exactly which forces are participating. Once you know which forces are participating, you know about the mechanism. And once we know about the mechanism, we can learn about the physiology of the nucleus. So what we what we know here about the system that the forces involved are the viscous forces. Specifically in this case, you have to distinguish um, the, the, it could be either the outer fluid or the inner fluid being dominating so you have the situation of liquid droplets, water droplets in air coalescing or uh, water droplets being immersed in honey and coalescing. You can already intuitively say, and from your daily life, it's a completely different situation. When you work out the force balance from physics, uh, physical laws, you will see also they follow completely different scaling behaviors. So we can do that for nucleus, and we find indeed that this uh, neck growth follow a power law of p to one half which is consistent with a picture that it's the out it's the viscosity of the outside fluid meaning the nucleoplasm the chromatin solution that dominates the coalescence kinetics of those two nucleoli so meaning it's really the chromatin that's slowing down these two droplets coming together moreover now knowing the physics behind it this is extremely powerful because this allows us to extract the material properties that are involved in this physics we can extract this ratio of surface tension and the viscosity of the surrounding fluid and as you know we from the separate experiment we have already obtained the uh, surface tension uh, independently so now we can actually obtain the viscosity here of the nucleoplasm so this is amazing because this is a completely non-invasive approach where we are purely looking the cell doesn't even know we're there and we have a complete rheological characterization here of the system so here just to to sum up briefly so so this has been a strategy that we've been using for past couple of years very successfully we have uh, work we have uh, analyzed the, the um, fluctuations of nuclear envelope and learned about uh, its uh, mechanism uh, involving both passive and active uh, parts as well as determined bending rigidity we are using it present presently for many other parts of genome as well as uh, many other nuclear constituents so uh, more about to come uh, in near future uh, so we with, with that, I, uh, for, for the sake of time, I will not go uh, through my conclusion slide in detail. Just briefly, I hope to show you in the first part that the genome is, is highly dynamic and has this peculiar way of having these coherent uh, regions of uh, genome moving together, where we've shown that it has to be activity in form of extensile dipoles that hydrodynamically interact that actually leave, uh, impacts that or is responsible for that. So that has major implications, of course, for genome organization and gene regulation. And the second part, I've shown you a novel strategy that we've employed for extracting material properties from the dynamics of nuclear constituents, which is enormously important because these material properties of nuclear constituents actually impact all cellular processes via the central dogma of biology. And on this note, I would like to hear Thank my team. So I've been very fortunate to uh, nucleate a very uh, a dynamic and enthusiastic team of uh, chromatin uh, aficionados. So it's been a lot of fun. This is how our life used to look like. This is how it looks these days, but I guess uh, that's uh, the reality for, for all of us. And uh, in addition to past and current members of my lab, I would like to thank my collaborators and funding resources uh, for supporting us. And of course you for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Yay. Thank you so much, that was a great talk. Um, we have time, I think for one quick question before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, we had a question come in through the Q&A about whether the CRISPR-Cas9 impacts the motion of the gene that you're that you're looking at. 
what did the CRISPR Cas9? That, that's a uh, that's a very good uh, good question. As uh, um, of course, uh, we cannot see the motion of the genome of the just that specific gene when it's not visualized, right? So um, th that is that is a very good point. However, what we can do, we can measure basically the genome motion with and without mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. so what we have, uh, so so what our control kind of is is the large scale. So, so our DCS characterization of the motion at all length scales and time scales and there we do not see any changes in the genome um, basically dynamic profile so to say at various length scales and of uh, time scales so in that we we presume not but uh, strictly speaking of course if we don't light it up with the CRISPR that very specific one then um, uh, we we do not uh, see its position we're presently trying actually to uh, find a trick around it uh, indirectly, uh, but uh, everything uh, suggests that it should not have any impact. Cool. Thanks so much. Um, I think just in the interest of time, uh, we will move on to our next speaker. But just a reminder, uh, we are happy to keep having questions come in uh, into the Q&A, and we can answer those questions um, kind of as part of the discussion as we continue as well. Um, Excellent. So our next speaker is Dr. Arjun Raj, and he is currently a professor of bioengineering and a professor of genetics at the University of Pennsylvania. And his research focus is on developing experimental techniques for making highly quantitative measurements in single cells and models for linking those measurements to cellular function, with the ultimate goal of achieving a quantitative understanding of the molecular underpinnings of cellular behavior. We're really excited to have him as a speaker today. And with that, I will hand it over to him. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's been a really exciting morning. Um, and I'm excited to tell you about some work that we've been doing on uh, the spatial distribution of pre-mRNAs and really kind of like where does splicing occur within the nucleus. Um, and I think we've learned a couple of interesting things. So, uh, And I really want to highlight this is the work of a, a really talented uh, scientist, Ali Cote, who just graduated from my lab not too long ago. So. Um, okay, so just a quick reminder as to what splicing is. So genes are a lot longer than RNA. Um, the gene gets transcribed into this long strand of RNA, which then gets cut up into bits. And some of the bits get put together, uh, the exons that um, get put together into the mature mRNA, and the introns get cut out and, and go somewhere. And so, uh, and they get degraded. So that's basically what splicing is about. Um, and why is splicing important? So splicing is important because um, it turns out when you cut up all these exons, you can put them together sometimes in different ways. And these different ways that exons can get put together um, lead to what's called alternative splicing. And that's a significant source of diversity in the proteome because you can get um, from the same gene many different proteins out of it. Um, so people have been studying splicing for a long time, as you uh, probably well know. Uh, and people really know a lot about the biochemistry of splicing. So they know where, you know, these different factors bind to the different ends. There's a donor and acceptor and nucleophilic attack and lariat formate. I mean, people really know a lot about um, the biochemistry of splicing. One of the things that's remained unclear is exactly where splicing occurs within the nucleus. So we can take these, you know, pictures of the cell and we have, you know, chromosomes and genes and mRNA, but um, where is splicing occurring? And the reason why that's an interesting question is that where splicing happens can inform how splicing occurs. Uh, I'll give you one you know, beautiful example of this is actually these Miller spreads from you know, quite some time ago. These are electron micrographs of ribosomal DNA being transcribed into ribosomal RNA. And you can see these strands of RNA coming off here. And you can actually see if you look at these really carefully that at some point um, the strands get shorter. And what that's indicating is that as the polymerase is moving along here, RNA Paul one in this case, um, there's a processing event that leads the transcripts to become shorter. So you can basically like visualize the, the where it tells you what's occurring. Um, one of the things that uh, people learned from this example and, and many others is that most splicing was thought to happen co-transcriptionally. Um, and just to lead you through what that means. So if you have an exon and an intron here, uh, as the polymerase progresses, you make more of that intron. Um, then as the polymerase keeps going, that exon one will get fused onto exon two, it'll get spliced on there and intron two will keep going. And then, you know, eventually it'll make exon three and then that gets put together. And then 
you have a completely spliced mRNA that's still attached to the RNA polymerase two over here. And then that goes about its merry way. So you have mRNAs and you have pre-mRNAs, but the pre-mRNAs are all happening. The splicing is occurring co-transcriptionally. And the idea is that this is thought to facilitate accurate splicing because as you're going along, you may wonder, well, how do I know which end to attach uh, this exon to? And if this is the only available end, then that's where it's going to go. And so uh, people thought that, you know, co-transcriptional splicing is really useful to facilitate accurate splicing. Um, but then how does this alternative splicing occur? Like, how could that happen? So that's one of the questions that we had going into this. Um, so what we wanted to do is just get a sense of, you know, how often is it really uh, co-transcriptional splicing. So um, we do a lot of imaging of RNA in our lab. And the idea was, well, okay, if you have co-transcriptional splicing, that would be all splicing that occurs near the transcription site. Um, but if you had post-transcriptional splicing, at least in principle, it could happen away from the transcription site. And if it happened away from the transcription site, that could facilitate potentially um, alternative splicing, like I was mentioning. Okay, so how could we actually see how much is co-transcriptional and post-transcriptional? Um, we used RNA fish, so this is a technique that we've been using for a depressingly long amount of time, um, where we label individual uh, parts, in this case, of an RNA. So we can label the exons in one color and the introns in a different color um, using little fluorescent oligonucleotides. And so what happens if this is the nucleus, you'll see um, this is the exon labels, and you'll see a bunch of dots in here. Um, each of these little dots out here is a single RNA, and then you'll see a whole pileup of RNA. That's really the transcription site, so that's really the genetic locus. Um, you can computationally identify these spots, and what you can do is at the same time in another color, take pictures of the introns. Um, you can then computationally co um, identify those, and you can co-localize them. And what you end up with is uh, are these pictures where you can see, well, um, some of these are spliced mRNA because they only have exons. Some are unspliced pre-RNA and some are transcription sites. And the unspliced ones you can detect because they have both colors on them. Um, and what we wanted to do is actually create sort of graphs of dispersal of the intron away from the transcription site. So uh, basically what we do is we kind of center everything around the transcription site and then we take the data from many different cells together, and we end up with these uh, dispersal graphs. So basically, how far do you find these pre-mRNA away from the transcription site? Um, so here are some results that we have across uh, actually a number of different cell lines, a number of different genes, um, and it was kind of wild. So what we found is that, you know, we had thought, okay, you know, splicing largely co-transcriptional, and certainly in many cases, you'll see that, you know, all these dots are pretty much located right around the transcription site. That's definitely a thing you see quite often, indicating that all the splicing is at least in principle happening co-transcriptionally. Um, but we found that in, for basically every gene, at least one of its introns showed pretty significant post-transcriptional uh, splicing. And we know it's post-transcriptional because these intron, the pre-mRNA is away from the site of transcription. And, you know, some, it's really remarkable. Some will be really tight. Some will have intron, these pre-mRNAs, like all, all around the transcription site. Um, I should say that the dispersal pattern is not inherent to each intron, but can actually depend, change depending on the cell context. So um, here we have the same intron from the same gene in HeLa cells shows a lot of dispersal. In uh, primary fibroblasts shows almost no dispersal. Um, I should also say that even genomically close into it also doesn't have to do with where it is in the gene. Um, you can look, so this is a quite long gene actually. Um, and if you look over here, you've got a couple of introns in pretty quick succession, eight, nine, and 10. Um, eight is very dispersed, nine has got some dispersal and 10 is not dispersed at all. And there's kind of no rhyme or reason to it. So it just seems to be some sort of property of an intron also dependent on the context. Um, Okay, so what's going on with the introns that don't show dispersal? Like those must be co-transcriptionally occurring, right? Um, so the thing is that if we really wanna be able to resolve that question, we needed to be able to peek inside a transcription site. So here's a, you know, a field of cells, um, here's a nucleus, and you can see inside of these, these transcription sites are these uh, little foci. Um, and what we really wanted to do was be able to look inside of that transcription site. So it's not just like a dot, but like what's inside the dot. 
And so the technique that we used, um, and this is a collaboration with Ed Boyden's lab, uh, was expansion microscopy. So we take the cells, we embed them in a gel, um, and it's kind of crazy. You just like put water on them and this gel gets bigger and the cell just expands and everything just gets bigger and then you take pictures of it and everything's just bigger. You can see what's in it. Um, kind of crazy, but it works. So um, what you can do is you can actually physically expand this up and you get you know, way bigger cells and nuclei and see what's going on in there better. Um, and what we found, what Ali found that was pretty remarkable. So here um, you know, we're labeling the five prime exons and the three prime exons. So the two ends of it uh, is that when you puffed up the trans, so initially the transcription site looks like one of these dots, but if you puff up the transcription site, what you'll see are these clouds of five prime and three prime signals, um, these nice little puffs. And in fact, we saw this for, you know, pretty much most transcription sites that we looked at, it's not like the one off. I mean, most of these have these, you know, puffs of five prime exon and clouds of three prime exons, and they have all these conformations. These are the middle introns. Um, you know, we still actually, to be frank, don't know exactly what all these conformations are about, um, but they exist. You can see all these conformations. The main point though, is that these three prime clouds are, uh, they exist and they're dis sort of distended away from the five prime cloud. So they'll be sort of adjacent to it. And that actually tells us something about this uh, co-transcriptional versus post-transcriptional splicing. And that's uh, the following. So the three prime cloud basically means that splicing cannot be happening co-transcriptionally. Let's say it were happening co-transcriptionally, what we would expect to see, like one reason that we see the five prime cloud is that you know, we have all these nascent transcripts coming off the uh, gene as the polymerase goes along. And so you have all these five prime ends that because of the length of the RNA could be kind of spread out all over. Um, and so you should see a five prime cloud, right? But then if you look at the three prime end, these little green boxes here, um, that three prime end, since everything gets spliced co-transcriptionally, by the time you're at the three prime end, it should just look like one tight focus. Um, all the three prime ends should only show up here. And then as soon as it leaves, it should essentially get spliced and then fly away. Um, that's clearly not what happens. We see something more like this. Uh, this example over here, where we have these two distinct clouds. In fact, if anything, the three prime cloud is bigger. Um, and what we think is happening is that the full length uh, of the pre-mRNA is getting made. And then that actually um, has to float away for a little while, while it's getting spliced. And that's, um, so it's sort of a proximal post-transcriptional splicing. So it's after transcription, but it's still occurring near the transcription site. And in some data that I'm not going to show you, basically what we were able to show is that there's a slow moving zone around the transcription site, presumably chromatin or something or other, uh, where these uh, pre-mRNA that are transcribed but not yet spliced are sort of slowly moving through it while they're continually getting spliced. And the existence of that zone is actually why I think there's a lot of controversy in this field. So some people say it's co-transcriptional, some say it's post-transcriptional. Um, and you know, if you isolate, let's say this whole fraction, the chromatin fraction, I think people had been interpreting that as meaning um, co-transcriptional. But I think what we're saying is that there's a significant amount of uh, pre-mRNA that hangs out near the transcription site um, because of this slow progress that it has to make through there. Um, and it's still post-transcriptional, um, it's just near the transcription site. So actually what we think is happening is something sort of in between. And the main takeaway from this is really that uh, splicing is decoupled from transcription. So um, these splicing events are occurring basically independent of whether transcription is occurring um, sort of all the time. And it's really this sort of spatial trafficking of the mRNA that determines what you see at a given time. Uh, okay, so what happens to pre-mRNA once they leave the transcription site proximal zone? So this was another question that Ali asked. Um, and the way that she went about, um, well, okay, there's a few different potential things that could happen. One is that they just, you know, freely diffuse away. So you, you know, get out of that zone, you just go about your merry way. Um, they could be tethered to the transcription site, um, or they could fill a compartment nearby somehow. Um, so anyway, these were some ideas, things that might happen. Uh, the way that Allie went about this is she used a splicing inhibitor. So one of the problems is that these things get trafficked and degraded so fast that um, she needed to use a splicing inhibitor to actually see where things are getting trafficked to kind of slow down that process. And what she found is that, you know, some number of them really just don't change. So you inhibit splicing, you perhaps see a few more dots around, but nothing really happens. Um, some of them do show that sort of dispersal phenotype where 
uh, you know, you inhibit trans, uh, you inhibit splicing, and you get way more of these pre-mRNAs are all over the place. But occasionally, um, for some genes, what we found is that when you inhibit splicing, they filled up these, um, these like nuclear bodies over here, right? Well, I'll tell you what they are in a minute, but um, they filled up these nuclear compartments, like a, an adjacent compartment. Um, and they never really fill the nucleus. So then the question is, what are they? It turns out um, they are nuclear speckles. So uh, shoot, I'm out of order here on my slides. Um, they are speckles. So if you look at the introns, they co-localize with these speckles and you see you know, pretty nice co-localization there. Um, they're definitely not tethers. Uh, so you could imagine that one part of the RNA is tethered to the gene and the rest is kind of floating around in the compartment. But if you label the two different ends of the gene at the same time, what you'll see is that they both fill the compartment. So it's really a compartment filled with these pre-mRNA on their way to be spliced. Um, and what's interesting also, so uh, one gene's um, introns, all of their introns will basically fill the same speckles, uh, but different genes can sort of fill different speckles. So they, and she's also done this without splicing inhibitors, showing that the gene itself will sort of traffic to, um, uh, traffic to particular, uh, speckles and presumably deposit it locally. So, um, Okay, and uh, I won't get into this and for the sake of time, but basically um, we did uh, a lot of work together with uh, Sterling Churchman and Kate Alexander from Shelley Berger's lab um, to look at how speckle association matches with sequencing. So some genes show the speckle association in trafficking, some show the dispersal. And that, um, I'm not gonna go through the data here, but you can take my word for it, that at least that to some extent matches uh, sequencing-based approaches where people have found um, that splicing indexes basically match uh, the distance to speckles as measured by, again, high throughput sequencing. Um, so the takeaway from this is that uh, pre-mRNA are getting spliced, we think, um, continuously and independently of transcription. And uh, the reason why this might have seemed confusing before is that we think that um, during, like, after transcription, they have to move through this slow proximal zone before they can go about their merry way. Uh, and then after that, some number of them will traffic to speckles and some number of them will just fill up the nucleus and then go out into the cytoplasm, presumably. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna end there. I really just wanna thank Allison um, Cote for doing a tremendous job on this project. Uh, it was really a, a wonderful thing to watch her develop this, in, this story. Uh, I really wanna thank Sterling um, and the people in her lab, Heather and Karine, who've been super helpful, um, Ed Boyden and the folks in his lab with expansion microscopy, um, and Kate and Shelley for uh, all the help with, you know, figuring out the TSA seek stuff. Um, and I also really want to thank our funders, especially the 4D Nucleome from initiative from NIH, which really helped fund a lot of this work in our lab. So uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was extremely cool. Uh, so anyway, thank you for a great talk. Um, we have time for, I think, a couple of questions. Um, we have one uh, from Megan King. If there are multiple splice sites available because splicing is post-translational, what generally imposes exon inclusion? Is there a role for the relative likelihood of random collisions that scale with base pairs of intron? intron. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the truth of it. So, um, I mean, I think the, the mystery is still, to some extent, there as to how... Um, you know, how, you know, you preferentially get certain, like on a biophysical level, why do certain collisions occur more than others? Uh, there may be some modeling work on this, like, you know, what would a random chain do? Uh, my guess intuitively is that that's probably not sufficient to explain why um, particular things. But I can tell you when you look at these pre-mRNA, they can get curled up in all kinds of different ways. I and mean, you'll see like, you know, introns over here, here, and exons all over the place. So uh, it's still kind of a mystery to me, to be honest. And, you know, there must be some kind of, you know, fundamentally, uh, the biophysical space is 3D. There must be some sort of 1D information in there that gets captured um, to allow it to, to make those things with high fidelity. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. Cool. Um, let's see, we have another question that just came in about what happens to microRNAs within these regions. Well, you know, the problem with microRNA is that they're very small. So <laughs> it's really hard to see them with our fish techniques, unfortunately. I think, you know, many people have spent a fair amount of time uh, trying to get those things to work and, you know, it's challenging. Um, I don't know. I really don't know about micro. I mean, 
I want to say I've seen at least some degree of microRNA fish where people have kind of looked at how it's trapping. Honestly, that was a long time ago, and I can't quite remember what the results were. Um, I do believe that, you know, I've seen sort of intronic microRNAs get processed out and uh, unclear that it's like, it, it didn't, based on a very small end, it didn't look qualitatively different than anything I've shown you. Cool, excellent. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will move to the next speaker. But again, um, please keep putting your questions in and we'll continue the discussion uh, in the chat and in the Q&A panel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. All right, our next presenter is Dr. Abby Buckwalter. She's an assistant professor in the Cardiovascular Research Institute at the University of California, San Francisco. And her lab is focused on understanding the cell biology of the genome. Their focus in the lab is on three main thematic areas, defining how the nuclear lamina promotes establishment and maintenance of cell type specific gene expression programs. Second, determining how regulation of the nuclear periphery by protein turnover shapes its functions. And last, exploring how disruption of the nuclear lamina promotes aging and disease. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Buckwalter. Thank you, Melissa. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be part of this uh, exciting lineup today and tomorrow. And thank you to the organizers for including me. So today, uh, what I'd like to discuss with you is uh, the work that we're doing to explore the time dimension of the nuclear organization. Uh, to begin to understand um, dynamic changes in nuclear organization over time. So by the time dimension, I mean, in particular, we're thinking about uh, the stability of individual proteins that make up different nuclear protein uh, structures and how that might influence function. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so in very general terms, the question that I'm interested in, and I think many of us as cell biologists in this group today are curious about is how diverse cell types are built and maintained from the same source code. Now we know of course that unique gene expression programs define cell types, that uh, characteristic patterns of gene expression are found across different cell types in the human body. Um, however, importantly, this gene expression is shaped and sculpted by cellular context. And as a cell biologist, it's that cellular context that I'm really interested in. So this can happen at a very local scale, like for instance, the function of a transcription factor, searching for and finding a target site, finding that site and influencing expression very locally, or at a more uh, large scale, such as for instance, DNA packaging around nucleosomes, or nucleosomes compacting and organizing into large chromatin domains. And this latter organization can happen at the megabase scale. Um, it's this type of large scale genome organization that my lab is particularly interested in. And we spend a lot of time thinking about the nuclear lamina and the roles that the lamina plays in three-dimensional genome organization. So the lamina is an intermediate filament protein meshwork that's found at the border of the nucleus underneath the nuclear envelope membrane and immediately on top of the chromatin within the nucleus in every metazoan cell type. It does a number of really important things for the cell, including prominently scaffolding about 30% of the genome and influencing the silencing of the portions of the genome that it, it con contacts. So uh, observations have indicated that the portions of the genome that associate with the lamina change from cell type to cell type, which has led to the idea that this association might kind of shape um, differentiation and, and shape the acquisition of cell fates. So ongoing work in my lab at UCSF, whoa, uh, is focused on a few questions related to the function of the lamina. So we think about how the lamina performs this function in scaffolding the genome, also are trying to understand how lamin function changes in aging and disease. And finally, trying to explore how regulation by protein turnover shapes the function of this structure. And it's this latter question that I'm gonna talk about today. So um, what do I mean by this question um, of how protein turnover shapes function? I think in very simple terms, what I'm um, prompting us to think about is how stable the nuclear lamina is over time. And if we think about this in terms of the life cycle of a cell, within an individual cell, if proteins that make up a structure are particularly long-lived, those individual proteins may never be replaced over the lifetime of the cell, leading them, leaving them vulnerable to perhaps oxidative damage or misfolding with age and loss of function. At the other extreme, if proteins are very short-lived, they may be degraded and replaced many, many times over the lifetime of the cell, leading them to be vulnerable to disruptions in homeostasis if either synthesis or degradation is just a little bit out of balance, and this might happen in aging and disease states. 
So these kinds of considerations become particularly important when you think about individual cells that have lifetimes of decades or even our entire organismal lifespan. So within us, neurons within our brains and cardiomyocytes within our hearts persist with us, us for decades, if not for our entire lifetime. So the question I'm really interested in is how these cell type specific gene expression and cell type specific nuclear organization is maintained in these long lived cell types over their entire lifespan. And to start to address that kind of question, I've taken a metabolic labeling and proteomic approach to quantify protein lifetimes in various contexts. This is an approach that I first started taking when I was still a postdoc in Martin Hetzer's lab at the Salk Institute. And we first started doing these types of experiments by using metabolic labeling in in vitro differentiated systems. So for instance, here in some data I'm sharing, this is from a cultured myotube system. And in this um, post-mitotic differentiated cell culture, uh, by tracking patterns of isotope incorporation in proteins over time, we could infer protein stability. So I'm showing you here two extremes that we pulled out of this data set. Oh, wow. Um, uh, at one extreme is this uh, lamin subunit, lamin B1, which we found was um, quite stable and very slowly exchanging within these cells. And at the other extreme was this DNA remodeling enzyme topoisomerase 2, which we know from other work is regulated by proteolysis. So it makes sense that it would be rapidly turning over in these cells. We can then uh, use these types of decay curves um, to actually fit and determine um, half-life parameters. We we're able to do this for about 1500 nuclear proteins. Whoa, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and determine this range of half-lives that are shown in this histogram on the right. So if we dig more deeply into this data set and pull out proteins of interest um, that are residents of different nuclear structures, including prominently the nuclear lamina and the associated nuclear envelope membrane, and chromatin, as well as transcription factors, we see an interesting spread in protein half-lives. So the proteins of the nuclear envelope and the lamina are shown in, shown in this group up here. And what we noticed right away is that two of the components of the lamin structure itself, lamin B1 and lamin B2, were in the top 10% most stable proteins we detected in this data set, while other components of the nuclear periphery were much more dynamic. We also found components of chromatin, including the core nucleosomes that were somewhat stable in this cell type, but also many components of chromatin that were quite dynamic. And interestingly, all the transcription factors we detected were quite short-lived in this cell type. So these kinds of observations open a lot of questions, like for instance, how does this stability shape function? What intrinsic characteristics might direct this long lifetime? And might this be intrinsic or might it be responsive to the environment that you're looking at these proteins in? And to start to dig into that question, I have continued to probe protein stability in other uh, differentiated contexts. So here is an example of a reanalysis from an in vivo metabolic labeling experiment that was done by Pei Pei Ping's lab in the mouse heart. And again, we're looking at the same categories of proteins. We see similar trends, but a much more dramatic spread in protein stability, where now all of the lamin isoforms that we detect are within the top 10% most stable proteins in the data set. And we also see some interesting features in chromatin where the core uh, histones that make up the nucleosome and are replication dependent are very stable, such as H3.1 here, but also components of heterochromatin, such as linker histones and the DNA methyl binding protein MECP2 are long lived in this post-mitotic tissue. So again, these kind of observations suggest inferences about function of these long lived structures and perhaps the time scale um, with which these long lived structures might be scaffolding chromatin organization. So we're continuing to explore this on our own now uh, with an ongoing collaborative experiment we're doing to perform in vivo metabolic labeling um, in mice over a 32 day time course. And we're collecting a number of different tissues from these animals to quantify protein turnover across tissues and to try to understand whether there are consistent trends in intrinsic protein stability or environmental factors that influence stability. This is very much still ongoing, but I can tell you that we've learned so far that the lamin proteins are indeed very, very long lived in the heart. And we see that they're about tenfold more stable in the heart than in the liver. So there are a lot of really interesting questions that this poses, um, including you know, what, are, what are the intrinsic changes in organization and structure of the lamina that make them so much more stable in the heart. But this also poses a practical barrier to understanding the function of the lamina. And by that, I mean, given that the nuclear lamins are such long-lived proteins, uh, if we want to disrupt these proteins and perturb their function, in particular in differentiated cells, uh, disrupting the gene or disrupting the RNA that encodes these proteins will have no effect on the protein. The protein will persist for a long time after that. 
So this means that we need approaches that will enable us to acutely probe um, and deplete individual long-lived proteins. So luckily for us, uh, this has been a real explosion of technical advances in the past decade. Um, and there are a variety of, of approaches to do this, all of which uh, use some kind of strategy for bringing a target of interest and in complex with an endogenous ubiquitin ligase, mediating ubiquitination and then degradation. We're taking a couple of approaches here and are exploring some interesting ideas, including using fluorescent protein tags as a kind of modular approach and affinity handle to mediate protein degradation. But we're um, also in the process of using auxin inducible degradation to mediate degradation of lamin proteins. So in this ongoing work, uh, we've now tagged each lamin isoform in cultured human cells in collaboration with Mary Dasso's lab at the NIH. And we first asked whether we could in fact effectively degrade these proteins, which seem to have such extremely long lifetimes in postmitotic cells. And we were encouraged to see that we could degrade these proteins within about six hours of auxin treatment, as you can see in these Western blots here. And also we can see um, with a fluorescent tag that we've also appended to these proteins, um, the, the timeline of this degradation within about six hours. So with these tools in hand, we can then start to ask questions about the roles of the lamina um, in establishing or maintaining cell fate. So we're first um, probing the interactions between lamina isoforms and chromatin in this cultured cell system, but we're gonna take the same approach and introduce it into IPS, IPSCs, uh, hopefully, then differentiate these cells into different lineages, including cardiomyocytes, and ablate the different lamin isoforms during that process of differentiation so that we can explore how the lamins shape and sculpt the acquisition and the maintenance of cell fate. Importantly, this is possible because even though the lamins play important context-specific roles, they're not essential for cell viability. So we can remove individual isoforms and evaluate consequences on cell identity. So hopefully I'll have more to share about that in um, coming months. So now I wanna shift my focus in my last few moments here to unstable nuclear proteins and what we can learn from this other extreme. So in um, many of the structures of interest in the nucleus, we also notice some components that have a, a short lifetime. Um, so these may be degraded and replaced many times over the lifetime of the cell. And intriguingly, in many of these nuclear structures, their degradation pathways are currently unknown. So this gives us an opportunity to uncover some new mechanisms of protein turnover. So um, a candidate protein that we chose for further analysis is an inner nuclear membrane protein known as emerin. This is a protein that's part of the LEM domain um, family of inner nuclear membrane proteins that binds to chromatin and to the lamina, um, as well as to the DNA cross-linking protein BAF. Emerin, uh, we noticed, had a short half-life in um, our early protein turnover experiments, um, making it a particularly interesting candidate for probing mechanisms of protein turnover. As an internuclear membrane protein, emerin is also part of a, a really unique subset of membrane proteins that are synthesized out in the bulk ER, but must then traverse the ER membranes and actually to traverse the nuclear pore in order to enrich at the internuclear membrane. And we know a lot about the biosynthesis and degradation of ER membrane proteins, but know comparatively much less about the mechanisms that degrade um, internuclear membrane proteins. Another reason that we chose emerin for further analysis is its intriguing links uh, and suggestions of disrupted protein homeostasis in disease. So a variety of missense mutations appear to destabilize this protein in a muscular dystrophy known as emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy. And a hallmark feature of this disease is an absolute lack of detectable emerin protein in patient biopsies. Oh, wow, sorry about that. Um, as you can see in this immunohistochemistry here. So using one of these uh, disease-linked mutants, we then started to characterize emerin localization and stability. And what we were surprised to learn was that under conditions where the ER was undergoing stress, we found that emerin appeared to leave the nuclear envelope and rapidly translocate perhaps into other membranes um, and then by about eight hours disappear out of the um, nuclear envelope and ER. This was quite a surprising um, route for this protein to take, and it appeared to not be involved uh, involving uh, canonical pathways of ER membrane protein turnover, such as ERAD. So we then uh, tried to determine what um, route this protein might be taking uh, to uh, eventually be degraded under conditions of ER stress. And we found that if we blocked ER to Golgi transport with the drug Berfeldin A, that we could completely rescue emerin at the, nu the nuclear envelope, indicating that in fact, the protein is leaving the nuclear envelope and ER to be degraded. 
We then tracked its movement through the entire secretory pathway, and we were surprised to learn using antibody uptake experiments that under conditions of stress, this protein is actually being transiently exposed to the plasma membrane before being internalized into endosomes, as you can see with this antibody stain here. We then wondered whether the terminal um, destination of this protein might be the lysosome and whether lysosome mediated degradation might be at play. And we confirmed that by inhibiting the acidification of the lysosome with the drug baphylomycin A1. And we found that under conditions of stress, if we inhibited lysosome function, we got complete translocation of this protein from the nuclear envelope into lysosomes, which we um, also could validate by staining for a lysosome membrane protein, as you can see here. Okay, so um, given that emerin has to leave the nuclear envelope to go through this very circuitous route in the secretory pathway, we thought perhaps that um, displacement from its lamina binding partner at the nuclear envelope was required. So we tested whether that was sufficient for this degradation pathway. And we found um, to our surprise that in cells that lack the lamin tether that emerin binds to, that emerin is still, uh, um, robustly expressed, but it instead is shifted to the peripheral ER. So displacement from the lamina appears to not be sufficient to induce emerin degradation. Instead, we think that there are signals within the emerin sequence that actively mediate this trafficking. And Jessica Mella, a really excellent grad student in the lab, has started to um, uncover how this works by doing some domain mutagenesis experiments. And she was able to determine that the LEM domain, which is a conserved domain on emerins and terminus, is absolutely required for this trafficking. If we remove that domain, emerin becomes insensitive to stress and never leaves the nuclear envelope and ER network. Um, intriguingly, that domain on its own, when fused directly to the transmembrane domain of emerin, appears to constitutively move through this pathway, and we can see really robust association and accumulation in lysosomes. Uh, we wondered um, whether other ER membrane proteins that have similar topology to emerin might also go through this pathway. So Jess tested uh, similar um, topology protein cytochrome B5 and found that cytochrome B5 does not go through this pathway, indicating that there's some specificity here. Um, and then she tried the experiment of fusing the transmembrane domain of cytochrome B5 to the LEM domain of emerin and was surprised to learn that in fact with this shorter and less hydrophobic transmembrane domain that the LEM domain could no longer mediate this trafficking to the lysosome, indicating overall that both the LEM domain and the transmembrane domain contribute to this very surprising trafficking pathway. So uh, for starting from some observations of protein homeostasis, we were able to uncover a novel and quite surprising degradation pathway for an internuclear membrane protein. We think this is mediated by the lysosome and we think that this targeting to the lysosome is directed by the LEM domain. And we're actively working to identify the factors that mediate this targeting to the lysosome and to understand how this pathway might modulate emerin function in response to physiological cues or in disease states, perhaps uh, including in this muscular dystrophy where protein turnover appears to be accelerated. So I'll just leave you with um, this idea of how we're using uh, these uh, measurements of protein stability to explore the time dimension of nuclear organization. So by um, profiling proteins that are extremely short-lived or extremely long-lived, we can identify proteins that have either been um, overlooked in functional studies before because we need new approaches to probe their function since they're such stable long-lived proteins. An example of that would be the lamins or identify proteins that are very unstable and uh, identify mechanisms of degradation and explore how those uh, protein turnover mechanisms might shape function. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank the members of my lab at UCSF. Uh, we haven't been able to see nearly of, as much of each other as usual. Uh, this year, but uh, we were able to get together um, for a masked get together earlier this year. Uh, I'd like to thank members of the Hetzer Lab and our collaborators at NIH and the University of Rochester. Um, and uh, my lab uh, recently surprised me with a second anniversary cake, which was very sweet um, and a nice excuse to get together. <laughs> thank you all for your time. I'll take thank questions. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, we have a couple of questions um, that are coming from our panel, so we'll post those in the Q&A in a second, but I will read um, a couple of them just to get us started. So one question we had um, from Gant Luxton was about whether you looked at Nesprins. He says that he remembers that the Warman lab showed that Nesprin 1 was degraded when it was not localized properly to the nuclear envelope. Mm. Yeah, so uh, of the link complex components, I think we've had more consistent coverage of the Sun domain proteins than the Nesprins. Um, so I, I'm not very confident in the Nesprin data, but I can say that the Sun domain proteins appear to be uh, not particularly stable. Um, 
in, in the tissue context that we've looked at so far, these proteins appear to turn over somewhat rapidly. Um, and then we have another question um, from Megan King about whether you think emerin is taking any other proteins or nucleic acids with it on its route into the lysosome. Yeah, that is a great question. Um, and we just don't know yet. You know, we haven't even really been able to answer whether or not um, it's taking BAF along with it, since, you know, we know the LEM domain binds to this protein BAF with pretty high um, affinity, but we don't know yet. Uh, we're doing some um, affinity purification experiments and hopefully we'll know more soon. Cool. Excellent. Thanks so much. Um, I think we will transition over to our quick break that we're going to take. Um, again, as always, please uh, keep questions coming into the Q&A. Um, we're happy to have discussion happen there. Um, thank you again so much, Abby, for the talk. So we'll be back at 10.15 with our next set of presentations. While we're on break, we just wanna give one more reminder that this is the first day of a two-day symposium. So day two will be tomorrow, starting again at 8.30 Pacific time until noon. Uh, members of the Allen Institute for Cell Science team will also be hoping, hosting a separate session to answer questions about the tools and resources that are available on allenscell.org. So you can learn more and register for that session on the event website via the link that we'll post in the chat. So thanks so much, everyone, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes. Megan? Yes. I just saw you know. Thank you.
And we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, right at 10.15.
Hi, everyone, and welcome back from the break. My name is Julie Cass, and I'm a scientist on the animated cell team at the Allen Institute for Cell Science and one of the co-chairs for the symposium. And I'll be the MC for the remainder of the day. Our next presenter is Dr. Ting Wu. She's a professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, where she also directs the Consortium for Space Genetics and Personal Genetics Education Project. Her group focuses on chromosome organization and behavior in the context of gene regulation and inheritance. And this emphasis has led them to investigate a diversity of topics ranging from the function and structure of paired homologous sequences to the organization of centromeres and the potential of sequence ultra conservation to contribute to genome stability and evolution. Today, she'll be giving a talk titled So Much Genome to See. Welcome, Ting. You go. All right, so I, um, I guess I control this with my clicker. I think I was trained well. So um, first, thank you for inviting me. I almost feel like I'm in Seattle. I really love this morning's conversations. Um, they remind me a lot of, about a topic that, that's been uh, occupying my lab, which is uh, genome dynamicity. So, um, and where we are going, why am I not able to advance? Let's see. Um, Ting, you may want, there you go. Okay, do I have control over that now? Should, yes. No, it's not Use really. Your, um, you can move your cursor to the bottom left corner to see the um, PowerPoint controls. And those are the. Yeah, they're not showing up. Oh, I there, see them I see. now. Okay, yeah. great. I see them now, thank you. So one thing um, that I'd, like, I'd love to talk about today is uh, something that my lab has been debating and I think we decided to do it to try and develop technology so we can look at the entire genome at super resolution and I'll explain why we got there. But I'll start by um, introducing the earliest technology we've been using, oligo paints. They are computationally designed oligos that have a region of genomic homology flanked by non-genomic sequences called streets. And that design is very much the result of Brian Beliveau's work when he was a graduate student. He is with all of you now at University of Washington in Seattle. Hi, Brian. And he worked very closely with Eric Joyce, who's now at UPenn. Now, one of the things Brian did when he was a graduate student is to work closely with the laboratory of Xiaowei Zhuang, in particular, Al um, um, uh, excuse me, Alistair Bettiger, who um, worked on uh, single molecule localization microscopy, as did Ralph Youngman and Meyer Avendano and Peng Yin's laboratory. And that, those collaborations led to two uh, technologies called OligoStorm and OligoDNA Paint. And importantly, around that time, Stephen Wang and Xiaowei Zhuang's lab uh, documented the ability for oligo paints to be used for sequential fish. And here, what we do is we barcode the um, streets and then we can label specific regions with complementary labeled secondary oligos that go to those barcodes. And I really also need to um, acknowledge Peng Yin, who participated a lot in the conversations with Xiaowei and myself. We actually wrote a grant proposal together, did not get funded on um, trying to get algal paints to work uh, for sequential fish. So thank you, Peng. Now, um, hmm. I don't know why this is happening here. If you want, you could just say next slide and we can okay. advance next for slide. you. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. Oh, I see it now. All right, so um, OligoStorm is the fusion of oligo paints with a single molecule localization technology developed in Xiaowei Zhang's lab called Storm. And the way it works is that it, um, identifies or recognizes single blinks of single fluorophores. And that's what gives OligoStorm its ability to give super resolution. What we do is we take the XY coordinates of those blinks and then we computationally mold those into a structure that has volume, that has surface area and texture. This is the structure that we um, model through other means. Now, this work that I'm showing you right there was very much led by Guy Neer, who is now uh, just about to start his job at UTMB on January 1st. He uh, worked very closely with Dean Lee in the lab and collaborated with Irena Farabella, 
and Mark Marti Vernon's lab. Ren is now part of my lab with Cynthia Perez Estrada and Rez in Rez Aiden's lab. And uh, we worked very closely with Bruker's microscopy team, in particular, Jeff Stuckey and Carl Ebeling. Now, one thing that became uh, very obvious is that there was a lot of variability. In fact, we've never seen any structure twice for any particular region. So here's that um, structure you've seen before. It actually is a 290 KB loop with 10 KB anchors right here. And this loop can appear like this, like this. Sometimes the anchors are exposed, sometimes they're fully buried. And, oh, wow, let's see. I'm gonna, I'm gonna different times up. Ooh, what I wanna show you, hang on, sorry about this, is that even sometimes within a single nucleus, the two allelic copies of a loop will have very different structures. Here you see the anchors are together for one loop and they're separate in the other. And our question is, wow. I don't know why this has worked so well during practice. Is there any way we can go back a little bit? Yes, uh, Megan's gonna take control back and go um, and she will do all clicking for you if you want to just give verbal <laughs> cues. We'll go back until you um, say we're ready. Yeah, I'm sorry about this. Okay. No it's okay. I, you might as well stop here because we've lost. <laughs> okay, go forward a little bit. Thank you. We'll, we'll try and stay steady here. So we see all this variability and uh, we are wondering, when you see two forms of a structure, the maternal and paternal copies and the nucleus looking different, does it mean that those copies are flipping back and forth between those states? Or is one allele permanently in one state and the other allele permanently in another? Or are all these structures we're seeing open for any, for that allele at any time? And each allele, maternal, paternal, is progressing through all these variations. If that's the case, then we have been wondering whether the difference between an open chromatin and a closed chromatin might be the speed with which an allele passes through all those states. So you know how we focus on structure a lot, but maybe speed of change of structure is another signature we should be paying attention to. I'm gonna try in advance. There you go, okay. All right, so thinking about that, we realize that to focus on one region or a handful of regions, when there's so much variability does not make sense because you may pick the wrong region to look at. In addition, and this really falls in nicely with the talks beforehand, when one region of the genome is varying, what is the rest of the genome doing? We know that the genome functions as an integrated unit. It replicates at one time, it divides at one time. Uh, genomes that do not, um, are not synchronous across the entire genome are, are unstable and often associated with disease. So we become very interested in how the entire 6 billion bases of the genome is coordinated. So here's where Guy decided not to walk along one genomic region, but to walk along four or five genomic regions at a time. We were very excited. The walking worked first time. We, we thought, oh, we should be able to get through the genome this way, and I'm going to try and advance. Thank you. So we did some math. Five chromosomes, 20 steps at one megabase per step is 100 megabases that took 31 hours. We'd have to multiply that by 30 to cover the entire genome. That's 930 hours, that's 39 days. And for many mammalian nuclei, they're so big, they fill the entire field of view. You know, if you work in Drosophila, you can get dozens, but if you work in a mammalian cell, you get one nucleus, and this was just not tenable. So uh, will we advance one slide, please? Um, we sat down and thought about why super resolution imaging is so slow and if there's anything we can do about it. So here to the left is that picture I showed you, the individual blinks, only I put them all there together. And when we, uh, when we take all their XYZ coordinates together, we get this beautiful three-dimensional structure. Now, if you click, thank you. There's a much faster way to image. And this is the way people have been imaging for a long time. You click one more, please. 
thank you. You look at all the floor fours, they don't blink at one time. And what you get is this big, big glowing structure. Um, all those floor fours make that reason, uh, make this whole uh, system very sensitive. And uh, imaging that is very fast. So this is where Bogdan Bintu and Alistair Bettiger in Xiaowei Zhang's lab, and now um, Matteo in Alistair's own laboratory, uh, took advantage of this uh, approach and developed a technique called ORCA, which is similar to a technique called high m that was developed by Andre Cardozo Gizzi in Marcelo Noman's lab. And now if you go up one more, thank you. What you do is instead of getting a full structure, you take the central centroid of that whole yellow glowing spot and you pick one XY coordinate and you put the dot there. Then if you click forward one more, thank you. Then you get rid of all the floor fours and everything's blank. Go forward one more, please. <laughs> thank you. You add your um, probe to, to uh, light up the next step. And for oligo storm on the left, you get a structure, but on, um, on the right, when you're using conventional microscopy and imaging all the floors at once, you get another single XYZ coordinate, and that's uh, the orange dot. Thank you, that's good. And then so on and so forth. Uh, eventually the left side, you get a structure and the right side, you go forward one more, you get a connection. Oops, you get lines between them, generating what we call the ball and stick approach. Now, the ball and stick approach is fast. You go forward one more, please. Thank you. And this is where we got very excited. We thought, all right, let's make the ball and stick method go as fast as it possibly can, and then see if we can fuse it with the space filling method of Oligo Storm that will allow us to image the whole genome at super resolution. And in fact, uh, Hoi Wen, Shantanu Chattaraj, and David Castillo, who's a graduate student with Mark Marti Gernome, um, worked really hard together on technique, which I'll tell you about in a moment. And we got a genome-wide um, image with 129 loci uh, imaged in a cell right after the uh, pandemic uh, allowed us to um, go back to work. It was very exciting. And, um, but it was a, it was a very short-lived very short-lived record because Sue et al. from Xiaowei Zhang's lab just a few weeks later um, published a paper using a technique they call DNA Murfish that uses hybridization, ours does not use hybridization, and imaged 1,000 targets. And now there's a paper in bioarchives from Long Kai's laboratory by Take, um, describing a method called DNA SeqFish, which has um, imaged 3,000 uh, loci. These last two techniques based um, on hybridization, I'll get back to that in a moment. So the, it's really a very exciting time. I think for genome-wide imaging at conventional resolution, um, you you really will be able to look at the entire uh, the entire genome, not uh, in sort of in a uh, discontinuous way. All right. So now, if you go forward one, our goal is to see if we can combine the ball and stick with OligoStorm to get a whole get the whole genome at super resolution. If you go forward one, I'm sorry about this. All right. Our technique for going genome-wide is called um, Oligo Physique. It's the combination of Oligo paints and physique, and it's been made possible by uh, Wei Wen and Shantanu Chattaraj in collaboration with David. It started because Sunny Wen, who was a graduate student in my lab, was talking with Evan Doherty, a graduate student in George's lab, and they realized that they could fuse Oligo paints with the physique method that Evan had developed with um, um, Jay Lee for localizing RNAs by in situ sequencing. And if you go forward one, the advantage of oligophysique is that it scales exponentially so that after only seven rounds of sequencing, you theoretically can target 16,000 regions in the genome. If you go one more, thank you. We actually um, um, made oligophysique work for three different approaches, sequencing by ligation, sequencing by synthesis, and sequencing by hybridization, which is similar to the Sue et al. and the Take et al. Uh, approach that we talked about earlier. But I'm going to focus on sequencing by ligation. One forward, please. It's actually very uh, simple, um, and it has this potential to um, multiplex with um, the physique method for localizing proteins and the physique method for localizing RNAs 
such that we dream in our head that one day we'll be able to localize proteins, RNA, and DNA at the same time with the same rounds of sequencing. If you go forward ahead, one, basically you take your oligo paints, you put them all on all the targets you want to image. Each target has about a thousand, let's say, or 500 oligo paint oligos, and they differ by the primer sequence, uh, differ, excuse me, by their barcodes, but they have identical primer sequences. So then you throw in your primer sequences, they're on all the loci, yep, you can go ahead, and then you just do sequencing. It's like in situ sequencing, you get signals and go ahead, keep going, and pretty soon the barcode is red. Thank you, you can stop there. And by decoding the barcode, you have the identity of your hundreds of targets. It's fast, the barcode is very compact, they're saving a lot of money. As I said, you can get a lot of targets and there's no need to generate label secondary oligos, which greatly reduces costs too. So you go ahead one. Thank you. So here is our 129 plex, 129 targets. Um, this went easily first try. We had a little glitch. We realized it was a tiny duplication. So then we just took our library, we put them on metaphase chromosomes and the library worked beautifully. And you go forward one more. Our goal and keep going. Our goal now is to bisect each arm with probes. Yep, thank you, you can stop there and keep bisecting segments until, that's fine, you can go forward. <laughs> you can go, for, yep, great. We've taken the X chromosome, we've put on 46 targets, and the density there tells us that we should be able to get between 1,500 and 3,000 targets per genome, and that's in the works now. Go forward a little bit more. Great. All right, so how can we get super resolution to work? Well, we go forward one. It's actually not that difficult. We um, Instead of super resolution imaging each target by itself, which can take up to two hours, we simply image all the targets at the same time in one two hour run. This two hour run has um, imaged 66 targets. We've actually taken our 129 target library and imaged that in one run. And then if you go forward one, we simply take that cell and keep, yep, thank you. We do four rounds of sequencing, decode all the spots, Thank you, you can go ahead. And then um, we you press again. <laughs> I should have made a movie. And this way you can get all your super resolution spots and know exactly what part of the genome you're looking at. You click it again. And this is a panel of all the spots we got in um, two hours at super resolution. This normally would have taken days to get. And press the key again. Thank you. So this is where we're at for trying to get the whole genome. Basically, um, Antonio and Sarah have, uh, this is their test library. They're looking at four chromosomes to decide how far apart chromosome walks should be and how big each step in a walk should be. And um, right now the goal is to be able to image an entire genome at super resolution, you know, fill up all those chromosomes in two to three days for um, oligo physique and one to two days for oligo storm. We go forward one more step. This is the construction on the streets. Um, each um, main street and back street has spots for oligo physique uh, chemistry, oligo storm chemistry for amplification. And we use these bridges sometimes to um, repurpose a barcode so we can bring in a bridge and um, enable oligo DNA paint. Oligo DNA paint is fantastic. It's the best uh, for getting a high resolution straight down to below 15 nanometers. And so we're hoping eventually in real time, someone can image, they see something good, uh, go to their microfluidic device, change the tubes, go in and really zero in on a locus. You go forward one more. Oh, right. The pending of the sequences is complicated. So Antonio has worked really hard to make a platform, Oasis, that allow people easily to append uh, whatever business they want on their streets. And one more. Thank you. Sarah is imaging, just to test out, the two ends of chromosome one. And um, so that together, that's um, uh, two five megabase walks of one megabase steps. And then in chromosome 21, she's taken three walks, and if you go one more, we're almost done. Um, this is a nucleus that had 
the two, the P and Q arms, the chromosome one over here and the two chromosome 21s together, the, those walks were contiguous, so they're one spot um, advance. This is a closer image of what chromosome one looks like. We can now look at the structure of the tips of chromosome one. And here is um, a very large segment of chromosome 21. We're starting to analyze that. And then one more click. I haven't had time to talk to you about the fact that we think one of the most important things of looking at chromosomes is looking at their surface, not just how they're folded up, but what they present to the environment. And with that, I'm going to close with thanks for my audio visual help. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through all their names. These are the individuals I, I mentioned during the presentation. Yelena and Juman, I didn't mention, they work on homolog pairing. Nuno works on centromeres. Tay works on ultra conservation and Mo keeps my lab going. Thanks to Brian and Eric and Ben who actually got us started on oligopanes and Sunny for oligophysique. One more. These are our collaborators. I mentioned along the way, I didn't mention these collaborators, Leonid, Yo, Kung and Bing because they, um, they worked on pairing. I didn't talk about that. Special thanks to Pung and to Xiaowei for getting us started on super resolution and one more. <laughs> My conflict of interest and thanks uh, for help from Bruker, Jeff and Carl, Steve and John, and Evan. I have to, um, he's been a friend for a long time. He's been at Recor and funding from NIH. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry about this. Hey, thanks, Ting, so much. That was a really exciting talk. And thank you for your patience with our slide advancing issues. So oh, well, um, we did doing. have uh, some questions for you and those will be in the Q&A panel. I think for the interest of time, we're gonna move to the next speaker, um, but we'd love to hear people's questions. And if you can answer them in the panel, that would be wonderful. Um, so our next series of presentations will be from one of the newest cohorts of Allen Distinguished Investigators awarded by the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group. The Frontiers Group is a division of the Allen Institute that recommends funding and re for re to researchers and centers across the country and internationally, whose work has the potential to accelerate scientific discoveries or reinvent entire fields of biology. The Allen Distinguished Investigators receive $1.5 million in funding over three years to explore their innovative ideas. The projects driven by these three pairs of investigators will study the interplay between the nucleus, the largest organelle in our cells, and the information center that houses our genome and other key structures in the cell. The first pair of investigators features, features Dr. G.W. Gant Luxton and Dr. Daniel Starr, both principal investigators at the University of California, Davis. Their joint lab is studying a protein complex known as LINK, whose role is to physically connect the nucleus to the cell's interior scaffolding system, otherwise known as the cytoskeleton. Their team will study how LINK complexes are formed in the cell, how they organize and influence structures within nuclei, known as nucleoli, and how they regulate the cell's mechanical properties. Welcome, Gant and Daniel. Thank you, Julie, and both Gant and I just really want to thank the um, Allen Frontiers group for entrusting us to do this exciting research that we're just getting started with and we're super excited to do. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about what our plans are for the next couple of years. When Gant and I were both postdocs, we both were interested in similar topics, which was how do nuclei move around in the cell? I took my um, developmental genetics training background to study nuclear migration in the C. elegans embryo on the left. And Gant took his training in biophysics um, and started studying nuclear migration and polarizing 3 t 3 tissue culture cells on the right. But before we could get very far about the mechanisms of nuclear migration, we had to answer some fundamental cell biology questions. Because the nuclear envelope is an extension of the ER, we had to figure out how cells specify what's outer nuclear membrane versus ER. Once the cell specified what the outer nuclear membrane is, how does it attach force producers to the surface of the nucleus? And then how are those forces that are generated in the cytoplasm transferred across both membranes of the nuclear envelope to something structural inside the nucleus, such as the lamins or the chromatin? And the answer to all three of these questions was, um, was link complexes. So link complexes stand for the linker of the nucleoskeleton and the cytoskeleton. Link complexes consist of a pair of proteins, um, a trimer of each, and um, sun proteins are on the inner nuclear membrane with a nucleoplasmic domain that interacts with lamins. 
a transmembrane domain, a, a domain that spans the space between the two membranes, and a conserved domain called the sun domain um, very close to the outer nuclear membrane. The sun domain can then interact with the second protein, cache proteins, which are integral membrane proteins of the outer nuclear membrane with a small cytoplasm or small luminal domain of about 30 amino acids that interacts with sun and um, sun and cache interaction. This interaction is sufficient to um, specify what the outer nuclear membrane is versus the ER and then target various modules of the cytoplasmic domains of these cache proteins to interact with various things in um, the cytoskeleton. And then the combined, these two proteins form a bridge to span the nuclear membrane. Now link complexes are involved in, in um, lots of different functions besides moving um, and anchoring nuclei, including nuclear envelope architecture, meiotic chromosome pairing, development of a wide variety of tissues, and, um, and, and many of these, of course, are related to disease. Um, so after um, 20 years of research support, or up to 20 years of research support this link model, um, but still many questions remain about how the link complex is formed and regulated. And so with the funding um, from the Allen Frontiers Group and the, um, um, and the Family Foundation, we plan to address some of these things. So first questions we wanna address are how are link complexes assembled? Um, uh, proteins are, uh, link sun proteins would be made out in the ER and then somehow have to get to the inner nuclear membrane as, um, as Abby uh, has talked about earlier. And then they have to trimerize. Um, you would not want a sun cache pair to form in the ER because that would be hard to get past the nuclear pore complex. We don't know anything about what regulates this trimerization of sun proteins. That's something we hope to, to learn. Another thing we hope to learn is to find small molecule inhibitors of sun cache interactions to make these things easier to study. We've developed an uh, intramolecular FRET probe uh, that is expressed in the lumen of the ER in the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear envelope. And when sun and cache interact with each other, there's um, FRET. And we want to use this probe to screen for um, chemical inhibitors or stabilizers of sun cache interactions. And then um, I just want to tell you a very quick thing about this giant um, cache protein called ANC1, which is the Nesprin 1-2 homolog in worms. And we think that this has many roles outside of the nuclear envelope and in regulating the mechanics of the whole cell. So this is the ER of a worm hypodermis. And you can see as the worm moves, the ER moves as a unit. But in the mutant, in the ANC1 mutant, the ER is fragmented and is, um, completely detached from the cytoskeleton. And clearly the mechanical properties of these cells have been um, altered in a, in a drastic way. And the second and third aims will study more mechanical properties and Gant will tell us about that. All right. <clears throat> so I just wanna echo what Dan said and thank the uh, Paul Allen uh, Frontiers Foundation and family uh, for their generous funding. We're super excited about being able to work on this project uh, together because it would definitely never have been funded by a more conservative funding source like the NIH. And so uh, the second aim of our project is to really start determining how link complexes harness the forces generated by the cytoskeleton in the cytoplasm and transmit them across the nuclear envelope into the nucleoplasm. And we're really uh, targeting a very fascinating structure that Alexandra introduced to you, the nucleolus. And uh, interesting work in mammalian cells has shown that link complexes seem to be playing some ununderstood role in regulating the assembly and morphogenesis of nucleoli. And in work uh, that we've been doing collaboratively with Steph Weber before we wrote this application, uh, here we've got the C. elegans four cell embryo. And uh, Steph has labeled the nucleoli with GFP tag fibril, fibril, I can never say it, fib1, let's call it that. And what you can see in the control is you don't have nucleoli, which are these two spots in the nucleus in the four cell stage, but you start to see it at the eight cell stage. Whereas when you knock down SUN1, one of the SUN proteins on the inner nuclear membrane, it's actually the only SUN protein expressed at this stage, I think, in development, you start seeing precocious assembly of the nucleolus. And so we think that mechanical forces are influencing potentially the assembly and dynamics of the nucleoli. And so it'd be really exciting to identify how this works mechanistically. 
in the second a, or the third aim, I should say, we're trying to figure out how the link complex and its physical connection to the cytoskeleton um, enables for proper cellular mechanics or regulated control of cellular mechanics. And so, as Alexander talked about uh, with uh, passive microreology, uh, the standard approach that people have taken is you uh, inject um, big uh, fluorescently labeled spheres here. Uh, what we're showing you is some uh, early studies from Denny Wirtz's lab at uh, Hopkins, and they're expressing various link complex inhibitors in these cells and tracking microreology, the movement. And so what they found was when they expressed the inhibitor of the link complex, so just this peptide that uh, interacts with sun, you get more movement suggesting that there's a softening of the cytoplasm or cytoskeleton. But it's unclear how that's happening at distances that are very far away from the nuclear envelope. And so one way to get around this is, or one challenge that we had to overcome here was the fact that this is very low throughput. Now you could take uh, the approach that Alexander took, which was uh, imaging endogenous organelles like nucleoli. We're taking a more exogenous approach, working in together with uh, Liam Holt at NYU. He's developed this beautiful system called genetically encoded uh, uh, micro nanoparticles. I can't remember what the M stood for actually at this point, but basically they're from archaea bacteria and they create these sort of capsid-like structures of different um, diameters. So there's a 40 nanometer gem and a 20 nanometer gem. And the beauty here is you can express, th express these in cells, in organisms, and then figure out by doing mean square displacement and uh, rheology measurements, the mechanical properties of the cell. You can also express these in the nucleus and track the mechanical properties of the nucleus, which is something we're very interested in as well. And so what this looks like is basically you image these little puncta, you then use AI and tracking to quantify then the mean squared subdiffusive behavior. And you can back calculate out uh, elasticity and viscosity measurements. And so we're really excited about taking this into an in vivo developmental system transparent and where we can express these gems in all different types of cells. So we can start measuring then the mechanical properties of different cells and different tissues over development uh, in different contexts where we have dis disengaged the nucleus from the cytoskeleton, for example. And so we're hoping to develop basically a cell type specific mechanobiology atlas, uh, both in C. elegans and in human cells cultured in tissue culture. And so with that, uh, I'll just end here because it's a short talk uh, by thanking everybody in our joint lab. Um, I'm very excited to have moved recently. I'm still actually in Chicago, but I was at the University of Minnesota for quite some time. And now I'm going to be joining this awesome group of people uh, at UC Davis to be able to study this link complex and how it controls mechanobiology. I also want to thank our collaborators. Uh, Everybody here is going to be essential for our execution of this work. And of course, the funding, which we would not be able to do this work without it, obviously. And then finally, we're, um, we've already hired two postdocs, and we're still looking for two more. So if anybody's interested in exploring the roles of the link complex and its assembly with us, please reach out and email us and let us know. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very exciting. And we'll continue to look for questions in the Q&A panel. Um, it's really exciting to be able to watch the relationship between what's going on in, within the nuclear membrane and within the cytoskeleton. So um, I think that's really exciting work that, that we're all excited to hear about. Um, so I think if we continue to look for questions in the panel, uh, for now, we're going to move on to the next talk for the sake of time. So I'd like to introduce our next Allen Distinguished Investigators, Dr. Megan King and Dr. Simon Mokri. Megan and Simon are leading a collaborative team at Yale University to study the physical and molecular forces that maintain the correct size of the nucleus. Their research team hopes to uncover the mechanisms that drive the measured scaling of the nucleus and the mysterious reasons why these mechanisms fail in disease. Welcome, Megan and Simon. So thank you so much. Um, Simon and I are thrilled to get to give this short talk talking about what we're hoping to do. Also very appreciative um, of the support from the ADI program. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about what our team will be tackling here. Um, so just starting with two of our favorite model systems, fission yeast on the left and mammalian cells on the right. And we're hoping to use both of these systems um, in the work that we are planning to do. 
Um, so Simon and I have been collaborating for nearly a decade. And we originally uh, started working together because of an interest in determining what uh, drives the mechanical properties of the nucleus. And so we developed two approaches that were really critical to our ability to assess this. And we were very focused on the role that chromatin plays. Um, so one approach that we developed was to, to uh, develop image analysis um, approaches that were able to reconstruct the nuclear um, envelope with very high precision. And this allowed us to look at the nuclear force response in vivo to microtubule forces. Um, we also developed this optical tweezers assay in which uh, we isolate nuclei. And this really allows us to get a full scope of the viscoelastic properties um, of the nucleus. I think Simon is going to tell us a little bit more about the other approaches that we've been taking, uh, been using more recently, in particular our combination of experiment and theory. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I also want to add to uh, add my gratitude to the gratitude that Megan expressed for the opportunity both to speak and also for the the funding. Um, so uh, an, another project that Megan and I have worked on is uh, sort of sketched out in the four. Uh, plots you see along the bottom of this slide, uh, connecting chromatin organization and dynamics uh, via single locus tracking uh, and theory simulation. So in these experiments, we, we track a uh, single gene locus, um, and you, you can see that in the, uh, the movie in, on the far left. Uh, and, and from that, uh, we can extract the, the mean square displacement of that, uh, that locus uh, and and we, do, we can do this in, in strains that have been uh, various different strains. So uh, there are three curves uh, in the second graph. Uh, the, the bottom one uh, corresponds to the wild type uh, and the two uh, upper curves correspond to uh, strains in which uh, cohesin in one case and condensin in the other case have been, have been compromised, their function has been compromised and is as you may know, the, those are proteins that are implicated in forming the base of uh, chromatin loops. Uh, and so I think we can infer from these data that uh, loops cause uh, the mean square displacement to, uh, to be decreased. The presence of loop, loops decreases the mean square displacement. Um, uh, so, so, so to sort of further check out this idea or investigate this idea, we. Uh, turn to theory and simulations. And what you can see in the third uh, uh, panel, the, the movie there is actually a, a simple uh, Rouse model type simulation of uh, a polymer with, with loops. Uh, and uh, one can from this kind of simulation uh, measure uh, via simulation, the mean square displacement. And uh, that's uh, compared in the fourth slide with the mean, dis mean square displacement of, uh, of a polymer with no loops. So the red uh, in the top left panel, uh, the top left corner shows a polymer without loops, the, the blue uh, confirmation of a polymer in the bottom right corner is a polymer with loops and uh, the, the red and the blue lines correspond to the, to the mean square displacements as a function of time of those two things. And so you can see that this simulation recapitulates uh, the experimental observation uh, that getting rid of loops uh, uh, increases the mean square displacement. Uh, and then in the, in the right uh, top, top right corner of the panel, uh, these are just uh, some, some, some images from a, from a new project where we're tracking uh, two loci in two different colors uh, and learning um, what we can learn from uh, measurements like the um, velocity order correlation of those, uh, uh, the cross correlation of those two uh, uh, signals. And I'll, I'll hand it back to, to Megan now. So this is what we've been doing. So in terms of what we're looking forward to doing, so we were in this project on nuclear mechanics, you know, our long-term goal was to develop a model which could really predict how the nucleus would respond uh, to perturbations. And we realize that there's a lot of fundamental biology that we don't understand that we really need to define in order to do that well. Um, and so um, 
one of the ways, the lens we've been thinking about this problem recently is, is really that this is related to how we think about nuclear scaling. Um, and so we recognize that the nucleus can take on a variety of scales and different organisms and cell types. And in particular, in systems where there's an increase in ploidy over time and DNA content, we see that the nucleus gets larger. But actually, the cell also gets larger as this changes. And this is an example of this conserved a nuclear to cytoplasmic volume ratio, which is broadly observed in biology. In fission yeast, again, one of our favorite models, uh, although there's a correlation here, DNA content does not dictate nuclear scale and work that was carried out by Frank Newman with Paul Nurse. Um, and thinking about this, we really realized we realized we had to reframe the question. And that is because although it looks like the nucleus is a closed system in this panel, or if we look just at the nuclear envelope, the bounding membranes of the nucleus that set at scale, it looks closed. But in fact, this is an open system. So the nuclear envelope is a subdomain of the ER. So we can ask the question in a different way. And that is, how does the cell determine what fraction of its endoplasmic reticulum is nuclear envelope? Because that is this nuclear scale question. And uh, this made us think about some observations that we've made previously. Here's a very simple one. These are electron micrographs of the nuclear envelope um, from a mouse tissue, the epidermis. And even though the nuclear envelope is really one continuous bilayer, you can just appreciate that it seems that there's different tensions at the inner nuclear membrane shown here in cyan and the outer nuclear membrane shown in orange. And these are connected at the pore membrane at the sites where nuclear pore complexes are inserted. So this suggests that actually these are not intentional homeostasis, that there's something different about the INM and ONM. And, and so thinking about this, it has given us ideas about how we can think about a model for how the, sets, the, sale, the cell sets the scale of nuclear envelope. And so this is the model that we're pursuing here. We're thinking about the nuclear pore complex as a rheostat that essentially ties the tension on the nuclear envelope to the nuclear surface area, which in turn will dictate nuclear volume. And so we think that there's some characteristic pressure and it's this pressure that leaves the INM taut as you saw in those electron micrographs. At some point, if that pressure increases, this will actually lead to tension on nuclear pore complexes. And what we're imagining is this connects these two domains in a way that allows membrane to essentially go downhill into this top membrane. And this will lead to an expansion of nuclear surface area. This is based on many other studies I don't have time to talk about. And so we really need to understand what determines this characteristic pressure or nuclear envelope tension, because this is intimately tied to nuclear mechanics. And I would argue, the scaling affects almost all of the biology that we're talking about today. Um, so just giving you one example of the kind of experiments we're doing to test this. These are fission yeast, you're looking at a nuclear envelope marker, and this is in a microfluidic system. We were basically pulsing these cells with changes in their osmotic condition. So you can see they go from kind of very plump round nuclei to these very wrinkled nuclei and back again. That's because we're cycling them through something that's at their normal osmotic state and an altered osmotic state. And so we think we can use this kind of data to allow us to understand things about the conductance of nuclear pore complexes, which we think is going to be important. We can use this to really vet some new tools that we're building and FRET sensors to measure the tension on the nuclear pore complex. Um, and the last thing I just wanna talk about again to really highlight what we think we can do by combining experiment and theory is to ask, what can we take out of these movies? What can extracting information from these morphological changes tell us about this system that we're studying? And we can do this because we're really good at reconstructing nuclear shape. And so Simon's just gonna take you through this last slide. Yeah, so um, what, what, what we wanted to say here is that uh, the wrinkling that we see in these yeast nuclei is sort of a very general phenomenon, especially if you get to my age. Um, but um, uh, you can understand wrinkling typically uh, as uh, a competition between uh, the, the cost of bending uh, in, in, in the case of the apple, bending the, the, the apple skin, uh, uh, which competes with the cost of uh, uh, compressing the bulk uh, of the apple. And uh, in, the, in the middle, you see uh, a, a sort of a, a very, uh, an experiment where uh, a friend of mine painted a, a stiff paint strip on, on a balloon and you can see that wrinkles nicely. Uh, anyway, the, 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 the point that uh, we sort of want to make is, is really the point that Alexandra Zadowska made earlier, that is if we can understand theoretically uh, what's causing the wrinkling, then it, it gives us access to all sorts of interesting uh, information potentially. Uh, for example, we might be able to measure the, uh, the flow of, uh, of the ER into the uh, inner nuclear membrane. Uh, we might be able to understand better the connections between chromatin and the 
and the nuclear envelope. Uh, so these, these are the kinds of things that uh, if, we, if we can gain a, a, a theoretical understanding of wrinkling, for example, uh, that we'll be able to, to learn, learn about. Thank you. All right, so we just wanna again, thank the, the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group for the support and our amazing team. I'm just highlighting a few of our members here. Um, and we've been recruiting some additional great people and we're looking forward to doing the work. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It's very exciting work. I know I've heard several conversations going on within the Allen Institute about people wondering what wrinkles or invaginations in the nuclear uh, structure could be for. So I know we'll have a lot of people who are really interested to see uh, the future of that work. So thank you so much for your talk and we'll continue to have the Q&A panel open for people to ask further questions. And now we'll move on to our next speakers. Uh, our final Allen Distinguished Investigators are Dr. Catherine Ullman of the University of Utah and Dr. Maho Niwa of the University of California, San Diego. Together, they're leading a research project to investigate the interactions between the nucleus and one of its neighboring organelles, the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER. Uh, the pair plans to study the interactions between the nucleus and ER by inducing stress on either the nuclear envelope or the ER and observing the effects that that stress has on the other organelle. They'll also ask how interactions between the nucleus and ER affect cell division. Thank you, Katie and Maho. Hi, um, I am having trouble um, starting my video. Your video is on, we see you. Oh, oh, okay, the control just went away, so I wasn't sure, thank you. Um, well, again, I also really do wanna thank um, both the organizers of the uh, current symposium and the uh, Paul G. Allen Foundation just up front. Um, and I'll just start by if I can advance slides. All right, so my lab has had a long-standing interest in nuclear architecture. And I realize that a nucleus uh, doesn't need an introduction here, especially after the really beautiful talks that we've just heard. But I just put this diagram um, up to illustrate key features to keep in mind when thinking about dynamic rearrangements that take place as the nucleus disassembles and reassembles with each cell cycle. And in this talk, I want to illustrate recent research from my lab focused on nuclear assembly, and then take a step back to put this in a bigger uh, picture that sets the stage for a new collaborative project. So these frames are from a time-lapse video and show some key steps in reformation of the nuclear envelope. And first you can see that um, Lamin B2, which is shown in green here, is being recruited to the edges first of the, these two anaphase disks. And LEM2, which is an internuclear uh, pr protein of, uh, at the nuclear envelope, is recruited with a distinct pattern, concentrating at what are the core regions of um, the reforming nuclear envelope. And just five minutes later, um, both proteins have um, dispersed around the whole rim. That makes it hard to see LEM2 in the merge, but what you can see is that the focal localization is now um, lost. And so what um, my lab found in a collaboration with Adam Frost at UCSF is that LEM2 is playing a critical role at this time in recruiting a class of membrane remodeling proteins um, called the escort factors. And in this illustration, what we're looking at is one of the upstream components of this pathway at the nuclear envelope, the escort protein, CHIMP7 in green. And you can see it um, co-localizes with LEM2 um, at that time of nuclear assembly we were just looking at. But if instead we express a mutant of LEM2 that's lacking the region that we found to interact, interact directly with CHIMP7, we no longer can see recruitment of CHIMP7 and in fact, the downstream um, escort pathway is also not recruited. So um, this is a critical step in bringing those proteins in. And what we find is that if that step doesn't happen, there are uh, really drastic changes to nuclear morphology because the, the envelope closure hasn't been coordinated. And we also found um, elevated DNA damage as well as just loss of nuclear integrity at this time. So just focusing on the nuclear envelope reveals a lot of complexity at this stage of the cell cycle. 
But taking a step back, it's clear there are additional aspects um, to be taken into account. And specifically, the Membertus ER network neighbors the nuclear envelope. And it's both closely connected as well as um, functionally distinct. So I'm going to turn things over to my collaborator, Maho Niwa, to expand on this. Thank you, Katie. Um, an example that illustrates the relationship between these two compartments is mitosis. Now, during this process, nuclear membrane must be disassembled, and nuclear membrane proteins and lipids are presumably mixed into the ER, allowing mitotic chromosomes to initiate spindle formation. Following chromosome segregation, nuclear proteins must be selectively concentrated back to the nuclear membrane during the reassembly of the nucleus, as we saw in Katie's uh, time-lapse images. So this reveals the highly uh, choreographed gymnastics that occur between these two compartments. Now, we have heard about the uh, endoplasmic reticulum in previous talks, but um, let me tell you a little bit about what actually happens in the ER the organelle that is the uh, focus of research in my lab. Uh, as a gateway of the secretory pathway, ER plays an important role in a broad range of functions. Uh, for example, almost all secreted proteins are generated in the ER, and synthesis of most lipids is initiated on the ER membrane. In addition, ER plays various other functions, some of which are shown on this slide. So the uh, ER is a dynamic, very active compartment with various different functions. But these functions don't remain static, uh, but rather levels of each function must be regulated in response to developmental or environmental cues. The uh, changes in the ER functional demands are commu communicated to the nucleus by a signaling pathway called unfolded protein response or UPR. Now in response to the increased demands of ER functions, which we collectively termed ER stress, the UPR components on the ER membrane recognize such demands and ultimately communicate to the nucleus to upregulate transcription of genes coding for ER chaperone protein folding enzymes and lipid biosynthetic components. This is at least one form of communication initiated from the ER to the nucleus. Now, it is likely that regulation of ER functions are required during the cell cycle. And we found another form of communication by studying what happens to stress ER in budding yeast as it divides? Now, in fact, we discovered a unique cell cycle checkpoint that ensures dividing daughter cells to receive functional ER during the cell cycle. When the ER is too small or don't have enough functions to split between two cells, daughter cells doesn't receive the uh, stressed ER. Ultimately, this leads to cell cycle block in cytokinesis. Over the years, we learned that these events are regulated by a unique cell cycle checkpoint that is independent of the UPR. Therefore, we term the cascade of these events as ER stress surveillance or the ARSU pathway. We now have a significant understanding of the ASU pathway at molecular level, and our recent study revealed that ER inheritance block is coordinated with chromosome separation in the yeast nucleus. Most recently, we extended our study to mammalian cells, and during mitosis, ER stress changed ER morphology in addition to ER functions, but we also found that ER stress altered nuclear membrane structure or morphology, and hinting further a link of these two compartments. So with, generous, with the generous support from the Paul Allen Institute, our team together with Katie and Harab, 
we look forward to investigating how such crosstalks are uh, established. Now, a general approach is to stress the nucleus by inducing, uh, for example, the nuclear membrane assembly defect, and then investigate the effects on ER structure and functions. Conversely, we will stress ER function and determine how the nuclear membrane dynamics or functions are altered. Now, ultimately, we think that results of our study will hold a key to understanding the highly orchestrated dance that is performed by the ER and the nucleus during the cell cycle. So with that, um, I'd like to thank both of our lab members and collaborators and funding from the Paul Allen Institute and other foundation for supporting our work. And thank you for the opportunity to speak at this wonderful uh, meeting. And finally, and not least, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this exciting talk. Um, we'll continue to have questions in the Q&A panel and um, we will move on to our next presenter. So our final presentation today, uh, I'm pleased to introduce is my colleague, Chris Frick. Chris is a scientist on the assay development team at the Allen Institute for Cell Science. And he's focused on developing microscopy experiments to eliminate an integrated multi-scale view of the nucleus and its activities. Today, he'll be giving a talk titled, Building a Holistic Picture of Nuclear Organization in HIPSCs. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Julie. I'm looking for my slides. My view might not be right. There it goes. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, sounds good. Awesome. Okay. So thanks, Julie, for the introduction. And uh, it's really exciting to have everyone here for this symposium today. These talks have been fantastic. Um, yeah, so uh, as Julie mentioned, I'm going to present to you our work today at Building a Holistic Picture of Nuclear Organization in Human-Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells. As Susan mentioned uh, at the beginning of the symposium, uh, we want to visualize uh, cell organization in a holistic way, capturing the major structure, all the major structures and organelles uh, within single cells to understand how cells organize themselves and how they reorganize uh, during differentiation and how uh, this organization relates to cell function. And slide will move. There it goes, awesome. Uh, today I'm telling you about how we are adding to our uh, ability to visualize organization by filling in the organizational details of the nucleus. Uh, and so the goal for a model of integrated nucleus that we'd like to capture would be one that captures the organization, shape, and position of key nuclear substructures and nuclear bodies, as well as 3D genome organization within a single model. So in the first part of my talk today, I'll tell you uh, how we are working to build such integrated nuclei to ask questions such as how does nuclear organization vary from cell to cell? What relationships exist among nuclear structures? Uh, is there dependencies among them? And is there a referencing system? And how does the 3D genome fit in? And we are excited to be part of a newly formed center in the 4D nucleome uh, to ask these questions and uh, gives us the ability to integrate imaging data with genomics data to make such types of models. And then in part two of the talk today, I'll tell you about how uh, we are working to uh, address the question of structure and function, looking at a particular structure within the nucleus, the nucleolus, and performing a CRISPR-I perturbation screen of uh, nucleolar morphology. So to build an integrated cell, we need to, we have uh, created cell lines that uh, tag structures that span the multi-scale 3D organization of the nucleus in the genome. And we make all of our cell lines uh, available uh, for purchase at cost through Coriel. And we also release imaging data for all these. So if you're interested in that, uh, please contact me or someone else on the team to know uh, the availability, availability of these lines. So I'll break this down by scale. Uh, we have structures representing the largest landmarks, the lamina, uh, nuclear pores, as well as uh, three layers of the nucleolus via fibrillarin, nucleophosmin, and UBF, including dual and triple edited lines. We also have nuclear speckles, uh, via a protein called sun and nuclear paraspeckles. We have chromatin level uh, structures, so histones, uh, HP1 beta for specific heterochromatin and EZH2 for polycomb repressive complex two. 
two proteins involved in topologically associating domain formation, CTCF and SMC1A, specific chromatin loci, telomeres via TERF2, and then we also have PCNA, which is part of the replication complex and localizes to active sites of replication during S phase. Then we have RNA polymerase II and two pluripotency associated transcription factors. Uh, and lastly, we're making more cell lines. Uh, these are in design and hopefully will be released in the upcoming year. So briefly, I wanna show you what these uh, structures, a subset of these structures look like in our cells and also uh, play through one of these Z-stacks here to show, emphasize that all of our imaging is done in 3D high resolution confocal microscopy. Uh, and so you can see uh, the different structures, look at the ones you're interested in. Uh, I wanna draw your attention specifically for this talk uh, to uh, the nuclear envelope via lamin B1, uh, the speckles via sun and the uh, nucleolus, as these are the first three structures that we have chosen for our integrated nucleus. We chose these because they represent uh, key spatial and functional organization aspects of the nucleus. So the lamina and the nucleolus are both enriched in uh, heterochromatin and more repressed regions of the genome. Uh, the nucleolus also is the site of ribosomal DNA and rRNA transcription and processing and ribosome biogenesis. Speckles, in contrast, are enriched in euchromatin and are uh, sites of active transcription, as you saw uh, in Arjun Raj's fantastic talk, as well as splicing. And so we have a short list of structures here. Eventually, we want to have a long list of structures. So I briefly want to tell you uh, uh, how we can make these integrated cells. We have four main approaches. Uh, we have, I'm only gonna tell you briefly about our label-free approach, but I do wanna mention that our superimposition approach uh, will be presented on tomorrow. And it's a very exciting work uh, about how, showing how we can get uh, analysis of all these structures within single cells. So don't be sure to check out that talk tomorrow. So briefly this label-free approach, uh, we take images, the way this works is we take images of cells capturing bright field image and fluorescence image of the structure of interest. And then we train a deep learning model to learn the relationship between the bright field and fluorescence image. So that uh, with this trained model, we can then take a new bright field image of a different cell type and predict the fluorescence for the structure of the model trained. And if we have multiple models, we can then predict multiple different structures from a single bright field image. So I'll show you how we use this for the um, our first integrated nuclei data set. So for our first data set, we're using real fluorescence images of nuclear speckles via MEGFT tagged sun, shown here in a cropped image along with DNA dye and a bright field image. And then using previous data sets that we've collected for uh, two compartments of the nucleolus as well as the lamina, we can train label free models uh, that we can then use the bright field images from this data set to predict in these structures, giving us ultimately 2,800 nuclei with speckles, DNA density, predicted lamina, and two nuclear compartments. We are not stopping here. However, we're excited uh, that with our collaboration with the 40 Nucleome, we uh, aim to include 3D genome models within each of these individual nuclei. And so briefly, uh, background on 3D genome modeling, uh, these approaches are well established and constantly getting better uh, to handle more challenges. Uh, the basic idea is taking polymer models of chromosomes uh, and then using genomics data, which specifies the interaction strength between specific regions uh, of the chromosomes and genomic loci, satisfying those constraints by folding these polymers and then giving a beautiful model like this, all modeled within an ellipsoid shape. And so now the goal is to merge these two uh, and perform genome modeling within these uh, image-based models of the nucleus. And this gives us increased accuracy for two reasons. One is that we're accurate, uh, actually modeling the nucleus within the geometry or the actual nuclear shape. And this restricts the possible confirmations uh, that can satisfy the genomics data. And then second, we are able to leverage spatial or leverage data that's not currently utilized uh, for 3D genome modeling, uh, which is TSA-seq, which specifies the cytological distances between chromatin and nuclear bodies. Uh, so then these segmentations of nucleoli or nucle nuclear bodies being, for example, nucleoli and speckles. So these segmentations of nucleoli and speckles then become powerful spatial constraints that restrict uh, specific loci within these models. So we get a whole that's much greater than the sum of the parts. It's not just stuffing a genome in. It's actually more accurate single cell 
uh, models of genome organization. So this is ongoing work and I don't have uh, these models to show you. Uh, this is just an illustration, but we have a lot of work to do just analyzing uh, our integrated nuclei, even without the um, genome modeled in. And so I wanna tell you briefly one observation that we've made from these integrated nuclei, looking at the relationship between nucleoli and speckles. And what we find is a very simple relationship uh, predicted, which is that the total volume of speckles and the total volume of label-free uh, nucleoli are strongly correlated, and that this correlation is independent of nuclear volume. And that second point is important because both of these structures exhibit substantial correlation with nuclear volume, and so this correlation could just be due to that shared correlation. However, if we restrict our analysis to a subset of cells holding nuclear volume constant, we see that this correlation still holds. And this is statistically robust. You can take uh, residuals from regressing on nuclear volume and you get the same result, for example. And so this highlights a really uh, interesting relationship between speckles and nucleoli uh, that suggests that they scale their volume uh, with one another. We don't know which is the driving force or if there's another factor that's linking these, but this is really interesting uh, for these two uh, nuclear bodies and how they are regulated within the cell. So next we want to make uh, more uh, integrated nuclei. Part of it, it will just be expanding our list, uh, but uh, so adding more segmented structures or spatial distributions or loci. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, however, is also explore uh, different ways of making these integrated nuclei. And one of the ways that I want to tell you about briefly, uh, we can is an approach where we can uh, trace the genome in single cells by filming replication via a protein called PCNA. So DNA replication and thus PCNA uh, move through the entire spatial and functional organization of the genome. So replication begins at transcriptionally active euchromatin uh, and these sort of dispersed foci, and then it moves to lamina and nucleolar associated facultative heterochromatin and then moves to constitutive heterochromatin at the end of S phase. And I wanna highlight uh, this idea was uh, really thought of by David Gilbert and all of this work has been done in close collaboration with him. So here is what MEGFP tagged PCNA looks like in our HIPSCs. And you can see cells uh, in early S, mid S, uh, late S, and you can even distinguish G1 and G2. So how can we uh, use this line to get genomic information in single cells? Well, recent data from uh, David Gilbert's lab and others have shown that uh, DNA replication occurs in a highly specific temporal order that is reproducible and near identical from cell to cell. So this plot over here on the left shows uh, when a sequence uh, undergoes replication, uh, genomic location, and then staging cells uh, across S space from early to late. And uh, the way this data works is cells are treated with BRDU, which gets incorporated in replicating regions of the genome. Then cells are sorted based on their DNA content and then sequenced for BRDU uh, substituted DNA. What you can see is that replication occurs or begins at the same sites and moves through the genome in a characteristic way. And this is near identical from cell to cell. That's why you get these really dark peaks instead of just a gray smear all the way across. Because of this, replication is uh, predictable. If you know where a cell is in S phase, then you can know what sequences are undergoing replication. So you can match early S to early S or mid S and late S to specific sequences. And this enables integration. So for example, this cell in late S, we have two foci under, that are undergoing uh, active replication. And if we know this is at the end of S phase, then we know that these 10 or so genomic loci must be localized to these two foci. So they're far apart in genomic space, close in physical space, uh, and this gives us a spatial constraint for modeling the genome. So we can restrict those sequences and the, in that place. So now the way to make this a real home run is if we can film cells so we can get accurate temporal staging. And so then we can accurately assign cells and their timing in S phase, uh, and then uh, assign those foci to specific genomic sequences moving through the entire sequence space of the genome and the full 3D volume of the nucleus. So to do this, uh, we turn to lattice light sheet microscopy because this gives us sufficient uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution. Oh, it's playing laggy, I'm so sorry. I really wish this video wouldn't, uh, I hope it's not laggy on your end, but 
you can still see some of the cool things, but this is beautiful when it's playing full speed. You can see this cell here. You can see foci appearing. This is that one minute time interval, so it should be super smooth. Uh, you can see here foci being resolved at the end of replication. Uh, and then hopefully, if it's not laggy on your end, you can see this cell here undergoing beautiful uh, nuclear rotation. And what, one thing we can see in the rotation is that the relative position of these foci are maintained, meaning that if we can correct for rotation, we can still track these foci in rotating cells. So we have a number of hurdles to overcome. We need to be able to image these cells for a full eight hours uh, to actually watch cells move through the entire duration of S phase, which takes about eight hours in these cells. We also need to be able to correct for rotation uh, and track foci. And rotation correction, we think we can accomplish, as you can see in this uh, sneak peek right here at this correction method. Uh, and so overall, big, big idea summary of this technique is that uh, with one structure labeled, we can get uh, genomic sequence constraints in single cells and trace the genome by watching replication. So this is a really, uh, really fun and exciting approach that uh, we're looking forward to hopefully show results sometime in the near future. So now I want to uh, transition to the last part of my talk, which is uh, looking at structure and function, specifically nucleolar structure uh, and uh, functions perturbed with a CRISPR eye screen. And I want to give two motivations for uh, why we're looking at a nucleolar structure. The first is that nucleoli uh, structure is tightly linked to nucleolar function. And so here I'm uh, showing you our triple edited nucleolus line, and these cells are treated with actinomyosin D, which at this concentration inhibits RNA polymerase or RNA ribosomal RNA transcription, which is uh, takes place within the nucleolus. And so you can see inhibiting this nucleolar function leads to dramatic rearrangement of nucleolar morphology over the course of two hours. So there's a tight link between uh, nucleolar function and morphology. The second motivation I want to give is that nucleoli undergo dramatic morphological changes during differentiation and changing cell state, but we don't have a clear idea of what functional changes in the cell result in these morphological changes. So here I'm showing you uh, our human-induced pluripotent stem cells and MEGFP tag fibrillarin. You can see that nucleoli are large, uh, few in number and centrally located in these cells. In contrast, after differentiating this line into cardiomyocytes, we see that nucleoli become small, more numerous, and peripherally located. And again, we don't really have a clear idea for what's causing the differences between these two cell types. So with those two motivations in mind, I want to tell you briefly about our CRISPR-I perturbation screen. So first, we had to engineer a, a crisp, nucleolar CRISPR-I cell line in which we have fluorescently labeled uh, two compartments of the nucleolus via MEGFP tagged fibrillarin and M tag RFP T tagged uh, nucleophosmin, as well as a stably integrated DCAS9 CRAB, CRAB being a repressive domain uh, that, target, that we can target to specific genes using a short guide RNA uh, with DCAS9. So then we take this engineered cell line and we can uh, take a large pool uh, of guide RNAs targeting 2,300 different genes transduce those into our cells, and then measure the effect on nucleolar phenotype uh, in a flow-based manner using a fax sorting. And so the way that we measure phenotype here is by measuring the pulse width of the fluorescence profile uh, of the cell as it passes through the detector. So as the cell passes through, it will pick up the fluorescence of the structure and it will give a pulse like this. And if the um, structure is a condensed form like this, it'll give a narrow pulse width. If the structure is a diffuse form, it will give a wide pulse width. So then we sort cells uh, based relative to the untreated sample, whether they become more condensed or whether they give a more diffuse signature. And then we can uh, bin them or sort them into these groups and then perform next generation sequencing to determine hits. So this first step uh, was all performed in collaboration with Martin Campman and has been successful. Uh, he was instrumental in both uh, designing and thinking through the experiments, as well as sequencing was performed in his lab. He's also giving a talk tomorrow, so to be sure to uh, come back tomorrow to see his presentation. So one, the caveat I want to give you before I show you our hits is that we have not performed microscopy validation of these hits yet. We wanted to, but due to COVID slowdowns, we haven't actually seen what these look like uh, in nuclear or in our cells yet. So. Our hits are reproducible from multiple replicates, so I'm going to still show you, but we don't know what they look like in cells. Uh, but there's interesting uh, suggestive links from our hits. So 
So I'm showing you 59 hits from two replicates, and these are uh, obviously reproducible as they've been replicated. And the good news is, is that some of them are unsurprising and some of them are surprising. So unsurprising is that we see some of them localized to the nucleolus, and you'd expect that perturbing them would perturb nuclear structure. You can see these in red. Uh, others have been found in other screens for nuclear morphology, and you can see those with asterisks. And then uh, surprisingly, we find a large number that don't fall into either of these categories. And in the condensed bin, we see an enrichment in transcriptional regulators, uh, activators of transcription, and uh, regulators of mRNA processing, which I think is very interesting given uh, the link that we found uh, between speckles and nucleoli. So we might actually be onto something here. Uh, and then in the diffuse bin, we see uh, more epigenetic modifiers. So this altogether suggests a link between transcription and epigenetic state and nuclear morphology. However, I want to again say we do not have uh, microscopy validation. That's in the works and hopefully uh, will be completed soon. Um, so altogether, uh, I want to now, before I uh, summarize, I want to thank everyone who was involved, the whole Allen Institute for Cell Science team, uh, everyone who contributed directly to this talk, uh, Frank Alber, David Gilbert, Martin Campman, uh, the center, the team and the center that we are a part of, and the 40 Nucleome, including Ting Wu, who you saw present earlier today in a fantastic talk. I also want to thank my wife. Uh, I'm sleep deprived today. She's only gotten about an hour of sleep every day this week from our four month old child, and our oldest son is currently sick with a stomach bug today. So uh, this is not possible without her <laughs> really taking the brunt of the childcare this week. So thank you to my wife, Courtney. Uh, and I also want to thank Paul Allen for his vision, encouragement, and support in founding this institute. And uh, thank you all, and leave this summary slide up uh, during questions if we have time. Uh, and also mention that our CRISPR, cell, CRISPR eye cell lines are available now for uh, screens that you might want to do for yourself. So thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, so I think we'll have time for one question, uh, but there are several in the Q&A, so um, definitely feel free to go back and we can answer those as we go. So um, for now, we'll uh, go with Megan King's question. Do you intend to explore different cell responses and see how this influences the relationships, for example, nucle nucleoli and speckle volume? For example, uh, she's curious how nutrient availability would alter that relationship. Yeah, that's a great question. And we definitely do. We want to be able to generate these uh, integrated models of nuclei in different cell states. So this is just an HIPSCs. We'd love to extend this to cardiomyocytes as well as intermediates in the differentiation process. Um, and perturbations like the one you suggested would be fantastic to do also. Um, so yes, definitely would love to see how these explore the connections and these relationships in these different contexts. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so to conclude today's session, Chris and I are going to moderate a panel discussion with all the speakers from today. So members of the symposium committee put together these questions to discuss the speakers interested in, interests in, challenges with, and the future of cell nucleus research. So we'll ask all the speakers to join us on camera now, and I will have Chris ask the first question. Awesome, thanks, Julie. So uh, first off, thank you all you speakers for the fantastic talks and for being here today. It's so fun to have you all in one Zoom room. Um, first question is aimed at trying to get to uh, know more, more about you in a personal and career-based uh, level. And so the question is, one second, if I can get this question to pop up in this window. I need to resize on the side of my small screen. Uh, there are so many interesting things going on in the field. How did you identify the thing that is most interesting to you? And to, in order to organize who speaks, I think I'll uh, call on people in order as they appear on my screen. So if Ting, if you would go first, uh, and then we'll move on to Alexandra and uh, Daniel, and then I'll tell you who comes next. <laughs> oh, Ting, I think you're muted. Not doing too well technically today. I just first want to say I think you're amazing for no sleep, two children, one not feeling well. I've just, I would never have guessed. <laughs> Thanks. Um, how did I identify? Well, I can tell you that actually I had told my future graduate advisor very firmly that I was sure that I was not interested in genetics and definitely not interested in flies. So I think that pretty much got me in his lab. Um, he, he showed me a microscope uh, and uh, a bunch of flies he had done a cross on. It was just so beautiful. So vision. 
Thanks, Ting. Uh, Alexandra? Yes, so I, I entered the nucleus uh, from a uh, polymer physics perspective, from soft condensed matter physics, since it's uh, kind of the canonical example of a oh. polymer inside of cells. So there's a uh, a lot of fun uh, to to be had, right? To be had uh, these days, and polymer physics has uh, been shown within past right uh, 15, 20 years as enormously helpful to help to um, elucidate the genomes organization. And once we started to look into that, especially looking into dynamics, then of course the other structures they are just there, they appear, so you cannot ignore them. So <laughs> we we came across them and started to learn about them, and it started to be even more interesting with respect to the liquid-liquid phase separations, right? And all the liquid condensates that are now present within the genome. And so now basically in my lab, we play with all of these components and are after a mechanistic picture of nucleus with all what's in. So cool. Thanks, Alexandra. All right, uh, Daniel, you are next. Um, I became interested in the nucleus because um, as a cell biologist and a geneticist, I could watch the nuclei move around. And when I started my postdoc, there were a whole bunch of really cool mutants from John Sulston and Bob Horvitz that have been sitting around for 20 years that nobody had worked on. And I figured that would be a fun thing to work on and it turned out well. Nice. Oh uh, yeah, the micros just seeing things in the microscope can be the, the driving force in so much of this. Uh, Gant, do you wanna piggyback off of Daniel? You're, you're next. Sure. I, best, I mean, there's probably two nucleus or nuclei for how I got into this. The first was, uh, when I was a rotating graduate student, I was in Gary Boris's lab. And uh, I remember telling him that I wasn't interested in the cytoskeleton. And he sat me down on a, on a computer and showed me Julie Terrio's images, movies of Listeria moving around on cat and comet tails. And at that point, I was hooked. And I haven't left the cytoskeleton since. But the other part was when I was a postdoc in Greg Gunderson's lab, um, I remember Adam Engler's uh, classic now cell paper came out about substrate stiffness directing stem cell differentiation uh, decisions. And I, I, I never really had thought about mechanics interfacing with cell biology before, despite the fact that I was working in the cytoskeleton. And so I remember that was just kind of this aha light bulb moment. And you know, working on nuclear movement in um, migrating fibroblasts was fun, but um, I got much more excited about um, the ideas of mechanosensing and mechanotransduction. And so I would say that's pretty much how I got into this. That's so cool. I love how persuasive advisors can play a role in this. <laughs> uh, Megan, you're next. So I think it definitely was the microscope. I was studying a protein that localizes nuclear pore complexes. Um, that's really in the Dynamon family. And the fact that the nucleus broke down and reformed every cell cycle um, is one of the things that really fascinated me, which is ironic because, of course, now we do a lot of our work in fission yeast that have a closed mitosis. <laughs> um, but uh, and I, I would say, like, in terms of, you know, well, you, those of you who know me, you know that I'm very bad at picking one thing to, to study related to the nucleus. Um, but this, I think at the moment, like our, our motivation for this work is totally dominated by these, what are the really fundamental like questions that don't even just apply just to the nucleus, but to cell biology that the nucleus is telling us we need to look at to kind of inform all of that. So I'm kind of obsessed with friction and membranes right now, which I think is like fundamental and kind of show up all over the place. Thank you. So cool. All right, Maho. Oh, um, so I, I worked on messenger RNA splicing and polyadenylation as a grad student. So that puts me kind of in the nucleus. But then um, my interest actually moved into um, cell bi more cell biology, uh, particularly after looking at a lot of beautiful pictures <laughs> of uh, ER. And you know, the, uh, depending upon different types of cells, actually the, the endoplasmic reticulum look different and the shapes are different, the amount is different. I mean, the you know, rough ER versus smooth ER or crystalline, and it's just fantastic. So I wanted to know how cells can even make those things. And that's kind of very naive, but um, no motivation. <laughs> that's great. Uh, Katie? Uh, well, thinking about this, uh does make me get a little nostalgic, but I guess I'll also date myself. I'll say I 
I was a grad student in Jerry Crabtree's lab, and I and I worked on transcription regulation as that was the focus of the lab, and uh, really still is, I guess. But but at the time, what what, what people in the lab found was that um, the factor that controlled a lot of the um, transcription that follows T cell activation was regulated at the level of whether it was in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. And I just found that just amazing because it it was this switch uh, that was based on localization. And I, at the time, really didn't do any microscopy, but that just set me down a path deciding that I would go to a lab for my postdoc that looked at the nucleus as a compartment and how things move in and out of the nucleus. And then I would just say from there, yeah, I definitely am motivated by um, imaging and unexpected results. So I've definitely not followed the path I actually thought I was setting out on. I got much more into cell division and other things, but but it was all motivated by watching things happen and then seeing something surprising. Cool. I like, yeah, random walks seem to be a theme in our trajectories at times. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Abby? Yeah, so I guess I would say, uh, you know, hearing the, the other panelists talk, I also came from a place of um, love of cell biology and microscopy early in my career. And I've always been fascinated by compartmentalization and how you build all of this beautiful intracellular complexity. Um, and uh, as a graduate student, I focused on um, an enzyme, uh, an ATPase enzyme that can sense and manipulate the curvature of the ER membranes and was really fascinated by that. And I um, was amused hearing Ting say that as a grad student, she was like, I'm not into genetics. I don't want to think about it. And I was that student also. I thought, you know, chromatin, well, mm, I don't know. But uh, as I started to um, my postdoc in Martin Hetzer's lab, that was kind of uh, um, jumping into the deep end, you know, listening to a lot of my lab mates. Um, think about and probe genomic organization and gene expression, but I started to get really interested in that interface between, um, you know, the membranes and the chromatin and how, uh, you know, you have this interaction between gene expression and organelle establishment and function. Bit of a random walk for me too. Nice, nice. Uh, Gita, you're next. So, uh, let me see, as, as others were talking, like, like Abby, I was reflecting on uh, my path. And I, I guess I can say, as many of you have been saying, I, my science and I am a product of my mentors and my mentees. And so um, I, um, I did my graduate work on RNA enzymes with Dan Hirschlag. So he, Dan, I like to say, trained me as an enzymologist, trained me to think like an enzymologist. And after my PhD, I said, oh, I want to use my enzymology training to study something more complicated than an RNA enzyme. And that's when chromatin remodeling motors had been discovered and people were studying them. And I landed in Bob Kingston's lab to study apply enzymology approaches to look at chromatin remodelers. And uh, I like to say that Bob got me, taught me how to think like a biologist. So I came like uh, as an enzymologist, Bob, Bob taught me how to think like a biologist. And in Bob's lab, I really got hooked on chromatin and uh, saw that there was way more to chromatin than chromatin remodeling enzymes. And this was such a complex template with a lot of potential for uncovering really fundamental mechanisms. And so I took that with, my, to, uh, with me to my own lab. And in my own lab, I have to say, it's, it's my students and postdocs that have really um, uh, stumbled on unexpected results that we can collaboratively work on. So for example, the phase separation uh, 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 direction arose because a student, Adam Larson, realized that a protein that he was making, HP1, uh, when it's phosphorylated, seemed to precipitate. And the truth was that he is an excellent biochemist and he was getting a super clean, super high yield of protein. <laughs> and uh, he would get this a turbid material at the bottom. And I would keep telling him, spin it down, take the supernatant. This is bad news if it's precipitating. And he didn't listen to me. He looked at it under a microscope and that changed things. So um, <laughs> that, that's kind of how we proceed to look at unexpected things like Katie said and uh, dig deep. That's great. Thanks so much, Gita. Uh, next, Arjun. And briefly, I want to make a plug for following Arjun on Twitter. Um, he posts very interesting science on Twitter, but also there's some very hilarious interactions between him and current and former students. So uh, find him on Twitter. It will brighten your day a little bit. Um, 
yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's Sorry, a good sorry. idea or a bad idea. <laughs> um, depends how much free time you have. Um, so yeah, uh, path. I think random walk is probably correct. Um, but it's kind of interesting. So, you know, I started out in Sanjay Tiagi's lab uh, doing experiments. I was like a mathematician by training. I was like, I'm not doing these experiments. And somehow I got in there. I just fell in love with it doing and like many people here is microscopy uh you know we label these uh rna you could see all these dots i was like wow this is awesome and then um after a little while i noticed these big bright spots i was like oh those must be i guess where the gene is and and i was always kind of wondering you know why do those spots hang out there and that was like 17 years ago and uh, there have been a lot of twists and turns since then. And then I guess somehow, sometimes with random walks, you just end up like back where you started. So, um, here we are. <laughs> now I know a little bit more about those spots. That's great. Thanks, Arjun. Uh, and then Simon, are you here still? Your video's off. Uh, maybe not. OK. Um, we are short, short, a little bit short on time, so we'll move on. Simon, if you're here, uh, pop on back, back, back on video, and we'll catch you in the next questions. Uh, so now Julie will have the next question, I think. Yeah. So the next one is for Gita, Ting, and Abby. Uh, there are so many ways that the cells change their expression in different states. For example, there are hundreds of cell types in our bodies, each with their own cell state. Do you think we underappreciate the diversity of structural organization of the nucleus, or are there only certain dimensions of gene expression that cause structural organization of the nucleus? And we'll start with Gita. Okay, so I'm gonna to have to ask you to repeat the sub questions and I may only be able to address part of them. And yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll just read the whole thing again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are many ways the cells change their expression in different states. For example, there are hundreds of cell types in our bodies, each with their own cell states. Do you think we underappreciate the diversity of structural organization of the nucleus, or are there only certain dimensions of gene expression that cause structural organization of the nucleus? Okay, um, so full disclosure, I will answer from my understanding, and I will then pass it on to Abby and Ting, who I think will have much more to say. Uh, I, I, I would say, I, I think we still do not fully understand uh, how the nucleus is organized at a substructure at a subnuclear level. And it's, it's going to be very different in different cell types. Uh, but we are going to need new kinds of imaging tools, which this crowd, this group is going to uh, uh, provide, ho hopefully, and are already providing to really understand uh, what are the substructures inside the nucleus. So I, I, I don't think we fully understand it. I don't think we take it for granted. Um, I think uh, we, we really, need, really need to figure out what the diversity of these substructures are. And, um, and I don't know if transcription per se is the only, uh, uh, only um, active process going on inside the nucleus that uh, we should be paying attention to. There's a lot of other things going on. Um, uh, things are moving around in the nucleus uh, during replication, lots of um, uh, reorganization happens. So uh, I think there's a lot to figure out. We'll pass it on to uh, yeah. uh, Abby or Ting, or maybe Julie, you can direct. Uh, sure, thank you so much. Let's, let's go with Ting next. Thank you. Keith, I really like what you said. I, I often wonder if we're looking at transcription a lot because we can measure it and we all like to measure things. And so we have a very transcription focused view of what we do because it's accessible. And all those other functions you were mentioning, I agree, I think there are a lot of them. I also wonder if transcriptions, the purpose of transcription is much greater than what we think it is. It's not just to create a product. It, maybe it causes turbulence. Maybe it, um, there's so many things. So. I, I would say maybe we do we do underappreciate what's there. And then I there's one other thing that I have been thinking about is um, you talk about cell autonomy and passage of you know some things are cell autonomous, some are not. But it's very I think it's possible that um, chromosome structure is not cell autonomous either. And so some of that structure might actually be communicative in some way, either forcing the cytoplasm 
to do something, or literally, I believe there are some, I think DEC is a protein that gets passed out of the cell into another nucleus and causes changes in that nucleus is chromatin structure. So it's, so so many cool things. Yeah, thank you so much. And finally, Abby. Oh, tough act to follow. What insight can I provide beyond Gita and Ting? Um, well, you know, so I think you were asking about uh, structural organization um, and whether that is a major mode of, of regulating gene expression. Um, I think we should also keep in mind dynamics and the ability to quickly respond to signals. I think that there are probably contexts and cell types where uh, you want to, a cell to be able to very dynamically and maybe not very stably respond to something like an immune cell responding to a stimulus or you know some kind of nutrient sensing pathway. Not all of these pathways need to be locked in and stabilized by some kind of um, structural organization in the nucleus. So. I certainly think that there are elements of structural organization that we still don't understand. And there's a lot of work to be done there, but I think uh, context, as Ting was alluding to also, context um, and environment probably dictate whether these things need to be really locked in or very dynamic. If I may, may I riff off a little bit just for a minute yeah, sure. uh, of what, what Ting also said and the question of, um, uh, I think there is, and again, uh, there's no answer, uh, just a thought process here to share. Um, I'm going to invoke Barbara McClintock. Um, and uh, she, uh, she uh, called the genome an organ of the cell. And I think it was interesting, if you look at it from that perspective, it takes us away from uh, our, the blinders we may sometimes put on ourselves because of the central dogma, that the DNA is an information carrier. Yes, that is one of its functions, but the genome itself is a physical macromolecule. It, and when it's packaged in chromatin, through the forces it exerts, as you heard from Megan it's, and, and some, of, some of our work and other work, right, it has other roles. So the genome is not just an information carrier. And taking the sum totality of the genome and in its organized form um, does bring us back to Barbara McClintock's description of the genome as an organ of the cell. And it's a very, uh, if you, in the modern day world, you would call it a systems approach. In the old days, you would call it a physiological approach, right? So the physiology of the nucleus is intricately linked to the genome as, the, as an organ. So I kind of want to throw that out there in terms of conceptualizing some of these things. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, nuclear function, you can't ignore the genome. I, I love that idea. Uh... All right, moving to the next question. This one is for uh, Arjun, Gant, and then Katie or Maho. So you guys can fight over who answers it. So the question is, a change in cell state usually represents a bifurcation. Cells go down a path. Are there other ways of defining a cell state and how should the field define a cell state in the context of the nucleus? So Arjun, would you like to go first? Oh, uh, sure. So, um... I spent a fair amount of time thinking about like how to define cell states and types and whatnot. Um, so I guess if you'll permit a somewhat philosophical thing, I mean, I think the a cell state is basically a complete description of, you know, where and what state every single molecule within the cell is in. And uh, obviously that's like completely impractical, but I think that um, you know, what we try and find are approximations thereof that we can then use to um, predict cellular behavior. And one of the questions becomes, you know, how high dimensional is it? Like, what's the effective dimension of this configuration space? So if there's this, like, huge number of different molecules, we could all, you know, have all these different configurations. But does it really come down to a pretty small set of parameters? Maybe, maybe not. Um, there's also a question of coupling between all those parameters. So if uh, the question, I, I guess what it comes down to is if you have a small number of cell types, how many things do you really need to measure to get at the functional properties of a cell? Like how many different things do you need to measure? And I think that ac actually that number is pretty small. So I've seen some papers where people can measure, you know, uh, structure or, 
know, some properties of the nucleus and essentially predict what that cell is going to do upon stimulus or which way it's going to differentiate. And I think the bottom line is, you know, with any very high dimensional couple thing, you can kind of measure anything and learn whatever you need to about the cell. It's just a question of, you know, the accuracy that you can measure that and how strong the coupling is. So um, I think you can measure things about the nucleus. They will tell you things about cell state in terms of, you know, how that affects the function of the cell. I don't think the nucleus is particularly special in that regard. I think you can measure a lot of things about a cell or you can measure a, a small number of a lot of different things and you can probably get the same information. So I don't, I don't know that there's any, like personally, I don't know that there's any particularly important thing about the nucleus relative to anything else in that regard. Thanks. I think, yeah, I think experimentalists appreciate that, that approach. Making sure that we can measure things is always good. <laughs> Uh, Gant, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you guys sent out the questions for the panel, um, I read this uh, one and I was like, cell states, hmm, I don't think about these that much. But uh, the more I thought about it, it got me thinking about um, uh, Van Beneden, who was a very famous cell biologist in the 1880s. And he described this idea of there being this inherent uh, organic polarity axis in cells that's dictated by the uh, position of the centrosome relative to the nucleus. And he called it the nuclear cytoskeletal or nuclear centrosomal axis. And so I've been thinking about how, you know, during this discussion, how does intranuclear polarity or cytoplasmic polarity correlate with these different states? And so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, the parameters being really organization and polarization. And, you know, there's only a few clear examples, I think, of um, intranuclear polarity. And I can, I can go over them if you want. But um, I think we need to find more of this. And what you guys are doing in your label-free imaging and modeling at the Allen Institute, I think, is going to help get us there, looking at the relationship of uh, intranuclear landmarks with intracellular landmarks and even extracellular landmarks. And so morphological polarity aligned along an axis of function, I think is going to be how I think about it, at least. That's very cool. Thanks. Uh, and then Maho and Katie, uh, you guys can decide among yourselves who you want to answer. It's really hard to decide when we're not talking. <laughs> Maho, I, I'm happy either way. What would you like? If you want, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm not, I'm not even quite sure what to add. I mean, I think it's like part of what we have to have in mind is just the fluidity of cell state too. Um, and at least incorporate that into the, um, into our thoughts of what defines it. And then, um, and then beyond the nucleus, I guess, you know, just working with Maho uh, to think about, you know, functionality of other organelles and their relationship to nuclear function to me could also define cell state. So again, I guess, although maybe it hovers around the nucleus, I don't know that um, we should be confined to thinking about the nucleus. Great, Can thanks I so much. Really one thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I totally agree. And just quickly, I think that um, certainly genome is important. And I really actually like the idea of genome thinking as an organelle uh, or DNA. Um, but the, uh, on the other hand, cytoplasm um, is the place where essentially other molecules are, and proteins are made there. And a lot of actually, you know, um, events occur, perhaps it seemingly independent of nucleus, but I don't think actually it's independent and it's very much interconnected. We just haven't got there. <laughs> so I think that, that you guys are, you know, doing really fantastic actually pioneer work to get to that question and I love that. Cool, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, it's so fun to hear all of these different ideas and how they synergize and how they're different and really help shape how we can think about these, these questions that we're asking. Uh, Julie has the next question for you all. I do, and I believe we, we have a figure that's associated with this one. 
So looking at this picture, how would you change it? This one is for Alexandra and Megan. So we'll start with Alexandra. All right. Thank you. Yes, 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 sorry, I forgot. Um, well, you have here a rather complex picture already. Uh, and I guess it was for the purpose of the drawing that the crowdedness of the genome here is missing at only a little bit suggested, right? So in my eyes, this should be very wildly crowded with the, uh, with the chromatin fiber. But then also there's at least as much, if not more, of short RNAs. And that is something that so with respect to physics, right, and material properties of the nuclear interior actually contributes very much to its unique viscoelastic behavior that I think needs to be considered in addition to all these embedded uh, liquid condensates that one has uh, within. So <laughs> this, is, this is pretty close, but it will be even richer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And how about Megan? Yes, thank you for covering crowding. This was also my first thought. But I think it also brings back to what Gita was saying about, you know, you're thinking about the genome, right? These non-genetic roles of the genome. RNA is the same story, right? So I think this is an excellent point. Of course, what I'm gonna say is exactly what I said in my talk, which is that this looks like a closed, that the nucleus is a closed system and there's no ER network, right? So the nuclear envelope here is actually, you know, part of a, of a, of a system that spans in general, the entire cytoplasm. Um, and so I, I think that, that keeping that in mind changes the way that we think about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and one thing, if I may add to that, also one thing that we tend to not think about when we look at these type of pictures. So you only see the entities that are in there, but you don't think about the fluid within the, which they're embedded. And that has a role as well, right? And so they, there are fluid mediated interactions and they they can they cannot be in vacuum, all these structures that we have here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, thank you. I will turn this back to Chris now. Okay, next question is for uh, Arjun, Katie, and Maho. Uh, and it is, how would you describe the flow of information in the nucleus? We know it's more complicated than DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. What other pathways of information flow exist and which are you most interested in? Uh, and we'll start with uh, Katie or Maho. Maho, how about you start? Okay. Um... So I'm going to start actually um, unusual one. <laughs> the uh, perhaps that, that, you know, we hear about all these viruses that utilizes or instead of actually going through the nuclear pore to get things out to the cytoplasm, but somehow it goes through the nuclear membrane and gets through, seems like a ER <laughs> and somewhere. And in that, this is kind of Avi's talk that, you know, the, uh, maybe actually there are more proteins like that. And that's just one part of information that moves from one place to the other. But I think that, that perhaps all these pathogens that invade our cells, host cells, are very clever that takes, you know, nuclear pore <laughs> like COVID, um, you know, and makes and then generate this structure with the ear membrane and has RNA genome in there. And it's just, I think that, that, you know, perhaps very fluid and not just one sort of known path is communicating. Uh, very random thought. <laughs> no, that's a great that. I love adding the translational perspective to this uh, very basic science uh, heavy group also. <laughs> um, Katie, you're next. Anything to add? Um, well, I, I, the thing I might add, and I actually think it's a little bit of an extension, is that in our linear way of looking at things, sometimes I think um, um, thinking about local concentration seems to be the new a new theme. And the example from um, our the studies in my lab is sort of just that local transient concentration during nuclear assembly and the importance of the coordinated events that have to happen there. So uh, I guess I would just say maybe that's a layer, but it's kind of like what Maho said, because I think a virus really in terms of um, creating that um, structure in the um, cytoplasm is 
creating a new way to get things locally concentrated. Cool, thanks. And then Arjun. Um, yeah, interesting question. So, I mean, I guess on some level, like, you know, we're interested in a lot of things related to epigenetics or like non-genetic or essentially cellular memory, which in many ways are, you know, proteins influencing the DNA, but not through, I think, exotic mechanisms, which is perhaps what the question is more about. Um, you know, we, we're working for some amount of time on uh, long non-coding RNAs, but, um, you know, to be honest, I kind of am interested in just the DNA RNA protein thing. I, I feel like I haven't really figured that out either. So, um, like, you know, it's like if I give you a DNA typewriter and I said, you know, make me a dog with three heads, like nobody would know how to do it. So I, I still don't think that we've even managed like that simple direction. So I don't know. Stick with that for a while. That's great. I totally agree. That's a great answer. I think, Julie, do you have the next question? I do, and I, it's another yeah. long one, so I just pasted it um, into the panelists. So the next one is for Ting and Alexandra, and it's uh, capturing changes in nuclear, nuclear organization across time is experimentally challenging. What tools do you think can be applied to this problem, and what additional insights would we be able to learn from such studies? Or what is another currently experimentally challenging aspect in the field that needs to be addressed? Um, so we will start with uh, Ting. So I, yeah, live imaging is definitely something we've been talking about and not to sound like a broken record, but if we could have a lot of um, image hundreds of spots and identify them later, I think this is something that um, was proposed by Long Kai a while back and other, other people. We may have the means to do that now fairly simply. So you tag maybe 500 regions, you, you follow them, maybe all in the same color, and then later on you, you backtrack. Um, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was, is there? Yeah, so um, the question was, uh, what do you think we could learn from that? Or what other currently experimentally challenging aspects in the field need to be addressed? Ah, so, um, I really um, am intrigued by the ability, so there's transgenerational inheritance and all those mechanisms. I feel that chromosome positioning could be a heritable, a piece of inheritance. And I would love to, that's actually one of the reasons we worked on oligo paints. We wanna be able to just see if chromosome organization can be inherited um, directly or transmitted and inherited. Um, for example, meiosis, is a, it's a fantastic process. I know for recombination, segregation, making, making um, halfway gametes, but it is such a powerful moment, a random choice between a random pair of parents and that meiosis, that pairing, you can assess diversity in the genome, um, diversity in the population. <clears throat> when you line them up, if they're the same, then diversity it's not so great. If they're different, then there's a lot of diversity. And I wonder about that part of feedback um, going directly to the genome and then inherited somehow. <clears throat> Absolutely, yeah, thank you. And then uh, Alexandra, please. Yes, so I completely agree with thing it's that the live cell imaging right is is bringing us uh, bringing us there and I think the biggest challenge is actually for us to collect the data and obtain information at different time scales and length scales right because it's not only about uh, observing uh, life structures in living cell but also all processes uh, will have their specific length scale that matters and specific time scale and so I think we have to be very careful that with each technique that you choose um, you will be of course you will be seeing a part of it and so we have to be always aware right that uh, we're seeing only 
what we're looking after, which also fluorescence in addition tends to confuse us because we're also visualizing and illuminating, right? <laughs> Only the entities that we're looking after and they don't live in the black space as our data shows, but <laughs> in, in a cloudiness. So I think it's, we need a lot of information at different time scales, at different length scales from many entities. And that needs to be then integrated basically together into one complex mechanistic picture, right? And so we have to have this, this simultaneous information at these times and lengths, and then we'll see them all move around and do their thing. Maybe I, I love your answer. In the lab, we often tell each other, chromosomes don't have eyes. They're not looking at each other. <laughs> so what we find very pleasing. So not what they find relevant. Exactly. Yeah, thank you so much. There's so much context to be captured in, uh, in our experiments. And I feel like that was a great discussion of that. So I'll pass it back to Chris. Thanks, Julie. Uh, our next question is for Gant and for Gita. And uh, the question it allows for speculation. So this is a fun one. Physics has been chasing dark matter for a long time. Where do you think the dark matter of the nucleus is? What are the things we don't even know that we don't know? And Gant, maybe you want to start? Sure. Um, this is another one of those questions that I read in your list and I laughed at because I was like, <laughs> oh man, I don't even know what to do with this. Um, I mean, there's so many possible answers to this question, but one that I keep coming back to is interconnectivity and integration, right? We don't know, and I guess, again, this is due to limitations in imaging, et cetera, time scales, length scales, how physically, temporally integrated structures inside the nucleus are with other structures inside the nucleus, let alone structures inside the cytoplasm and structures outside of the nucleus. And so I think, you know, starting to put together data sets that show correlations in positioning, correlations in dynamics, anti-correlations, these sorts of um, basic biophysical observational, if you will, uh, insights would really advance our understanding of the cell and the nucleus as biological entities um, and illuminate um, mechanisms that we haven't even begun to consider. Yeah, thanks. That reminds me of our, uh, Arjun's comment earlier about cell state and just if we can figure out which things are correlated, it reduces what we need to measure also. And also interesting when correlations break. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, Gita, next for you. Uh, yeah, I had a similar reaction as again. Uh, I'm going to date myself here because it reminded me of something uh, a former Secretary of Defense said several decades ago, uh, a decade ago, unknown unknowns. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember it. Uh, so what are the unknown unknowns here? Um, and and, and I, I'll just add to what Gant said. I, I think from my very highly biased perspective, uh, the unknown unknowns are um, how do we take into account the the really um, specialized three-dimensional nature of the macromolecules themselves that are participating in the nucleus? Because depending on how we address the questions, we think of them as either points, rigid bodies, or uh, macromolecules with defined structures and dynamics. And so uh, not taking for granted that we can explain everything from first principles, just with what we have and say, physics says, uh, if you have a macromolecule of this size, then it's gonna behave like this. Not taking that for granted, but actually doing the experiments and looking for the unexpected biophysical behavior of the macromolecule and seeing, oh, okay, this molecule does these 10 other things that we didn't expect. I'm making it up, 10 is too much. Three other things that, you know, and then reintegrating that into the into uh, physical models and then going back to first principles. And so I think that's a whole area that is going to really rely on experiments, uh, so empirical data. But thinking of molecules not as um, letters or points, but as entities, as, as yeah, <laughs> with personalities, let's put it this way. I like that. Thanks so much. Uh, Julie, next question. Yeah. So um, this one is for Megan and Abby. Where do you think are the exciting directions for the nuclear field? What challenges are interesting and how might collaborations help us make more progress in understanding these questions? We'll start with Megan. 
I think I could, this can follow directly on the conversation we were just having because um, when Gita was just talking, I think in some ways it's focusing on the basic observations that we do not understand. I think just, just defines kind of exciting direction. So I'll give you another one of those, at least that I think about, um, and Simon and I have been thinking about a lot, which is that um, if you have like a fused chromosome, so you can't actually segregate uh, the chromosome bodies, then you get these tear-shaped nuclei where 180 degrees from where you have the chromosome bridge, you get this dimple, you get this heart-shaped nucleus. And this is something that I do not understand because some of the way that forces are transduced across the nucleus have to explain this. Um, and I think that there probably are some maybe very simple ways of modeling or thinking about this. And we've been, we've been thinking about them, but at the moment we have no framework for understanding this. So, you know, Alexander's work and looking at the correlations in these motions is right as giving us hints about that, but we still don't know how to think about this. And I think the, the other thing that I would just point out that's a challenge, um, we talk about the challenge of, of, of being able to see dynamics in real time on the length scales that we want to have access to, which is tough. The other thing that was missing in that diagram beyond the crowding is just how huge a chromosome is. I think that we, this is something that no one else has had to deal with is the size of a chromosome, right? Ribosomes are small, like this, this is a beast. And that changes a whole bunch of behaviors. And I think that's part of the answer probably to this question that I posed and how, it, how entangled is that polymer probably is an important component, you know. Um, you know, the chromosomes grafted together in some way, which is one of Simon's ideas about what happens at the interface between individual chromosome territories. Um, what does physics tell us? And to, and to make progress collaborations, what I would argue is we need simulations and experiments. We need the experiments as Gita was saying, we need empirical observations, but we also need to be using um, simulations to try to see how simple can we make it, right? How, how can we use the first principle? Um, so but it's an exciting time to do that. Absolutely. I remember the first time that I learned about the size of um, of the DNA content that gets packed into a cell. I feel like my eyes bugged out of my head and it's such an interesting question in terms of physics. So uh, now I'll turn this to Abby. Yeah, so I think that there's a lot we can learn about how genomic state relates to cell organization and, and nuclear organization. So, you know, one of the things that, that Chris talked about um, that's going on with 40N and Allen, I think is really important to try to understand how 3D genome organization uh, interfaces with you know, the actual nucleus, the organelle that this genome is found in. Um, and also I'm really jealous of people in the single cell biology field who are building these huge atlases of different cell types that they have you know, these transcriptome parts lists for. You know, what do those cells actually look like? Uh, what's the organization of all their nuclei? You know, what's the diversity um, from the cell biology perspective? I would love to know more about that. And I think, I hope that we'll get, you know, more cell biologists tackling those parts lists and those cell types and trying to understand how they work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I think based on time, we do have one final question, but I think we'll ask for maybe just one or two volunteers who are particularly excited to answer this one. Um, so our question is, what is your favorite component of the nucleus and what is its popular, popular embodiment? So maybe a cartoon or animal or food that you would use to exemplify that component of the nucleus. Do we have any, any volunteers to wrap up our panel? So if I may, then I start with the obvious that I'm sure that many of you have uh, likened uh, chromosomes uh, to spaghetti to your students in interface, nu interface nucleus. So we have uh, enriched it even more. We refer to nucleoli as meatballs. <laughs> so now you have a spaghetti bowl with meatballs in it. <laughs> I like that. That's a good one. All right, so I think with that, I just wanna say thank you so much to all of our speakers today for your excellent presentations and all of your time discussing further in this panel. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for day one of the Seattle Cell Science Symposium and for all of your engaging questions. That concludes the webinar for today. Um, we look forward tomorrow to see you for day two of the symposium. Uh, we welcome you to review the agenda for tomorrow. There's a link in the chat if you would like to take a look at that and register for the Cell Science Tools Q&A session if you have questions about the tools and resources available on allencell.org. 
As always, we wish to thank our founder, Paul G. Allen, for his vision, encouragement, and support. So thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Together. It's great. <laughs>